Okay, Mr. Marshall, uh, you are a co-host. It is 6.32. You have um, everyone who is expected to be here tonight, which as you said, is a small quorum, but we're good to go. Okay. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of August 17th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. I'm here. Uh, Tom Long is absent. Andrew McDougall is absent. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, Johanna Newman is absent. And Karen Winter. Karen? You're muted. Here. Good, thank you. Sorry. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right. Uh, so the first item on our agenda tonight is approval of minutes, and we have the August 3rd minutes, which was our last meeting. Uh, board members, uh, any comments on the minutes? None for me, other than that I thought they were exceptionally thorough. I mean, compared to 20 years ago, it's rather stunning, actually. Well, uh, thank you, Bruce. You should know we've had a lot of conversation in the last year or two about the uh, proper level of detail in minutes. So we are where we are and uh, uh, Chris and Pam are doing a great job keeping up with us. <clears throat> Anybody have any other comments? Okay. So that being the case, uh, does anybody want to move the approval of the minutes as drafted? Bruce, so I see you're, 
Teresa, I see your hand and I'll, I'll recognize you as making the motion. I'll go ahead and second the motion. Any further comments from the board? All right, so we'll go through a roll call vote. Uh, Bruce. Approve the minutes as uh, presented. Thank you. Uh, we'll skip Tom and Andrew. Um, Janet. Hi. And Karen. Hi. And I'm and I as well. Motion passes for uh, in favor and no uh, rejections. Okay, we'll move on to the second item, which is public comment period, the general public comment. As I stated a moment ago, this is for topics which are not on our agenda this evening. Are there any public comments, uh, any members of the public who would like to make a comment? I see that we have five members of the public in the attendees area. I don't see any hands raised for those from those folks. So going once, going twice, going three times. All right, so the time now is 640 and we will end the public, the general public comment period. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Um. A question, really, a, a protocol, perhaps to you, Doug, or, 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 or Chris. Um, I've been a, a, a attendee of the, uh, plan, of the uh, school committee uh, meeting for the past two and a half years, and it's always frustrated me that I couldn't see who was attending. Um, I'm wondering whether it's ever been suggested uh, that uh, the chair read the list of attendees so that people know. I, my sense of this is that if this was a regular public meeting, uh, providing you weren't blind and you could cast your eye around the room, you'd know who was there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is a significant failing of Zoom that the attendees don't know who's in the room. Um, so I would always like for, uh, not just for this board, but for any board, but particularly this board, because I'm now a member of it, that we might make a policy of, uh, of before the public comment of reading who the attendees are. Uh, and it's, if, if uh, I don't know whether it's a motion, it's a suggestion and, uh, it's a, and also a question because there may be some protocol that I would can't imagine, but maybe that would uh, say that that was uh, not appropriate. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Chris, do you have any comment on that? I guess I will say that Sometimes the names that show up in the attendees list are not actually the person's name. It may be a spouse or it may be some other shortened name that doesn't really give you a full sense of who is who they are. Um, but, you know, at least this evening, it looks like we have five members who have a first name and a last name, uh, whether that corresponds to the actual people who are watching? I don't know. Chris? I just wanted to make note of the fact that tonight we only have five attendees, but sometimes we could have as many as 50. So um, we might want to be judicious in when we read the names um, or not. So if we set a precedent, um, then we may end up having to you know, go through a list of 50 names on some nights when we have a very um, interesting topic. Well, I have noticed that the attendees, you know, it's not consistent through a meeting. Um, sometimes people come in late and sometimes a lot of people leave early. Um, so by the time we get to the later part of our agenda, it's gotten a lot smaller. Janet? Um, I I'm going to agree with Bruce's suggestion because people have, um, commented to me and I think to the board that it's kind of alienating not to be able to see who else is there or even how many people are there if you're a member of the public and have often asked to have those names listed. Um, and I do think, you know, if there's 50 people in the audience, like if you're just attending a meeting and you don't know, you can see the participants, but you can't see the public and there's 50 other people, that would affect how I felt about the meeting in a way, or like I'd like to know that. Um, so I would go for just reading the names. I also know that I've attended like Zoom meetings where I could see 
I wasn't a participant on the panel, but I could see the other people's names. And I wonder if that capability could be, um, you know, we could go to that. So somebody who's interested could sort of, anybody in the audience can kind of go through the names and look around. Okay. So um, I guess I'm wondering whether we ought to delay setting that precedent until we have a larger group. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Or does anybody, should I just go ahead and start that? I think you could start it tonight and then say that this isn't setting a precedent and we're going to try it out. And um, if it becomes a problem in the future, that it won't continue. OK. All right, so the members uh, of the public that I can see in the attendees list uh, consist of Bruce Allen, Elizabeth Veerling, Maura Keene, Pam Rooney, and Sophia Holden. All right, uh, I guess we can move on to the third item on the agenda. So this is Planning Board Review and Recommendations to ZBA. So this is, I believe, a presentation of uh, a project that is coming to the ZBA. And we expressed some interest in hearing about in advance of the ZBA hearing. This is concerning ZBA FY 2023-02 with Michael and Tracy Holden request a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit, ZBA FY 2007-43, to allow the construction of a one-family detached dwelling as a complementary principal use to the existing two-family detached dwelling or duplex under sections 3.01, 3.320, 3.321, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 1147 North Pleasant Street on map par uh, 5C, uh, parcel 35, located in the Village Center Residence or RVC zoning district. And welcome, uh, I believe that's Michael that I see in the picture rather than Sophia. And so welcome this evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. And. Uh, I will say it, uh, Chris, uh, you can do an intro in a moment, but I wanted to say at the outset, I think the main reason we asked you to come was where we were interested in the, pro the way in which you are allowed to do this and uh, wanted to understand the process under which you're proposing and how this, you know, and how this is allowed in the zoning bylaw. So Chris, did, was there anything you wanted to say before we hear from, from Mike? Yes, I wanted to say that um, I think that the reason this is being allowed to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals in this manner is because there is an existing special permit on this property, um, and the special permit is for a two-family house. Normally, um, if you had um, a single-family house on a property, you wouldn't be able to add another single-family house because there's no mechanism to do that in the zoning bylaw. But since this already has a special permit on it, the door is kind of open to having another special permit to do something else. So um, there is a section of the zoning bylaw that says, and I should have read this, I should have had this ready before, but it's section 3.01, I believe. Um, and maybe Pam can find that so we can all read it together. And 3.01 talks about, here it is, um, the development or operation on a single lot of more than one dwelling or more than one of the principal uses described in section 3.3 is expressly prohibited except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or were other, otherwise provided by this bylaw. So when the zoning board um, reviews this case, they will need to make a finding that these two uses, the use of the two family house that already exists there and the use of the single family house that's being added um, are complementary uses. So I just wanted to put that into context. And now you are being asked to um, make recommendations to the zoning board of appeals about this project. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. And Mike, if you want to tell us about your project. Sure, just quickly before Mike jumps in, I can share the screen with the ZBA application. So um, Mike, do you want me to do that just to start sharing the screen and you can direct me where to go or? Yeah, no, that'd be great. I don't have the ability to do it on my end, so. And uh, it's probably not useful for people. Um, sorry for all the scrolling. Uh, where do you want me to start, Mike? Um, I mean, basically, um, the project that I'm presenting to the ZBA is the idea that um, I purchased a property 14 years ago, about 14 years ago, and um, purchased it as a non-owner occupied uh, home that was being used as a um, variety of uses prior to um, us purchasing it was a doctor Sandra, Sandra Godin's doctor's office on the first floor in the front had an apartment in the back that was occupied and a small apartment on the second floor that was occupied not all of which um, wasn't technically on record with the town it was listed as a single family house but uh, with commercial use for the doctor's office but I don't think they had uh permitting let's say or been approved to have the two apartment units in it so we purchased as a single family house and i applied for the special permit to convert it to a two-family dwelling which it was more or less already had been being used as um, but we went through the process of converting it to a two-family so we had uh, the front approved for a four bedroom and the back approved for a two bedroom um, and it was not owner occupied for close to 14 years now um, this past year um, back in the fall my family decided I've got three children, uh, ages 10 through 16, and we decided to move to Amherst. Um, the front portion of the house was unoccupied uh, come the end of last summer, and we decided to move into the front house. Um, we've since enrolled all three of our kids in the Amherst school system. I've got uh, my middle daughter entering freshman year of high school, my older daughter's entering her junior year, and then I've got my son entering fifth grade. Um, we as a family have decided we want to stay in Amherst long term. Um, the kids are all loving the school system. The issue with it is that the front part of the house is not conducive to a family of five. Um, technically, it's uh, listed as a four bedroom, but it's really a three bedroom with a fairly large living room and, and dining space. But um, it has we knew moving into it um, that this was sort of a temporary situation. Um, that it wasn't conducive to our family of five. So we considered various um, options and really decided my kids love the location of the property. Um, we've got the bus directly across the street. We're just a couple of miles up the road from, from all three of their schools and uh, started inquiring about the possibility of putting a single family uh, owner-occupied dwelling unit on the property. Uh, we had gone in front of the ZBA um, about 13 years ago. At the time, we were considering um, trying to add additional apartment units to the property, and uh, we did not proceed with that. Um, it wasn't approved at the time, uh, and so we just sort of left it as, as it's been for the last 13 years as the just the duplex on the front portion of the property. Um, as you can see, there's a decent, it's a decent sized lot for the area. It's in North... Um, Village Center Residential in North Amherst. Um, it, when we purchased it, it was technically there's you can see a um, sort of the remnants of a dotted line where it has had been two lots, um, but we purchased as one because it wasn't a flag lot. It had no frontage. Um, when we when we made it a two family, we merged the two lots together, um, but been uh, met all the requirements once we had it surveyed that we have enough land to meet the coverage requirements um, for it. And it just seemed like a perfect opportunity for us to be able to live um, in a great location, um, conducive to uh, my family of five, where the, all three kids could go to school just a couple of miles up the road, have the bus um, directly in front of our house. And after talking to the planning department, um, tried to find a way that uh, it could be approved to allow us to do so, which was uh, as a complimentary uh, use to the front duplex. 
All right, great. And it looks like you probably did the drawings for the house yourself. I did. <laughs> looks like you had fun. I know we have a couple architects uh, present, so I uh -huh. hope you don't criticize my work too much. No, but no, I, I no, did not, uh, spend not, some time over no the past criticism. year working in SketchUp. Yeah, that looks looks good. Thanks. Uh, so board members, any any questions or comments for for Mr. Holden? Janet? Uh, you are muted. You don't have enough. Do you? I, I don't. I'm. I don't have the frontage requirement in front of me. But it sounds like you don't have enough frontage to do a flag lot. Is that no, correct? correct? And that's. I think it's a hundred feet. But I'm, I might be just making that up. Um. And they are in. Um. And so when you went in front of the ZBA for like more units, when you said you did not proceed, is that because you felt like you weren't gonna? get the permit just from the way it was going or oh uh, yeah we withdrew our application without prejudice at the time thinking we might go back in front of the zba um it had become apparent it wasn't going to get approved to add additional apartment units um at the time uh one of the, th the some of the feedback that we were given at the time was had it uh, had we been applying to have it be owner occupied that it, they probably would have been more open to it this is again going back I think almost 13 years ago before the new master plan was done for North Amherst. Um, um, another, another question I had was just, yep. um, and, and it could be for Chris as, as well as um, you, Michael, is what given, I don't know, the given the size of your lot, how many units in RN can you get? You know, just not, you know, just if it was, you know, a converted dwelling or whatever, just how many units, what would be the maximum units you can get for the size of your lot? I believe uh, at the, well, I believe it would allow for up to five units. Yeah, but this is RVC, right? Village Center Residential, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. In RVC then, let me revise my question. I'm sorry. So is it five units in RVC? Uh, that's the, uh, I don't have the uh, bylaw in front of me, but I believe when we looked at it 13 years ago, um, we were told we, the, the area, a uh, lot size would allow for up to five units. Okay, thank you. In some form. At the time, I think we were doing it, uh, we applied as uh, condos because that was the bylaw at the time that would allow us to have um the units that we were looking to do mm -hmm. in retrospect should this move forward i'm you know i'm glad uh that that did not get approved at the time because 13 years ago uh, you know if you'd asked me then if i'd be living in amherst i, I would have guessed no um but now that i've got kids in at school age um amherst uh became much more desirable for us to move to and um you know, my kids, the whole family is loving being in Amherst. And like I said, we, we want to stay in Amherst long term. Well, I'm, I'm actually happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, I have, I just want to note I, for the board, what I think is true is that um, the ZBA can put an owner occupancy requirement, but I think that at any point, these, um, this could be converted to condos and, um, you know, so the buildings could be sold separately and things like that. I'm not sure it would keep the owner occupancy requirement on your one thing, but I, I know there's sort of ways to sort of um, move away or get more owners in, which could be positive or negative. That's it for my questions right now. All right. Thanks, Janet. Bruce, I saw your hand. Um, yes. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, I found out that uh, I know Michael because when I checked the uh, Mike Holden phone number on the application that uh, was the one I was familiar with. So <laughs> I, I don't think disclosure is necessary, but uh, just for the information of the board, uh, Michael has uh, worked uh, for years for projects for Coldham and Hartman and in fact has done two uh, house projects for me personally. So we have a business relationship. Um, but that's uh, as far as it goes. Um, uh, and Mike, I was really pleased to 
at the prospect that you're moving into town as Janet, I, I think it's nice, but being uh, in North Amherst myself and, and uh, uh, you're just near the farm and uh, I'm always interested in uh, capable people who move close to North Amherst Community Farm. So you can expect to hear from me on that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you that we were neighbors now. <laughs> no. Um, I, I, a couple of questions. The uh, th This would be a non-conforming lot, I would imagine, having a frontage of 90 feet in a in a in a, a, a RVC requiring 120. Correct. Um, so, uh, does, uh, is all of what we're talking about, uh, and this is perhaps not a question for you as much as for Chris, is all of what is being proposed um, affected, compromised, uh, or if, let's just say affected in any way by this being a non-conforming uh, lot? Chris? Um, you are allowed to change things on a non-conforming lot. Um, I don't see that that's a problem. It's been done many times in the past. So the CBA will recognize that this is a non-conforming lot when they grant their, if they grant their permit. Um, yeah. It's allowed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. Um, uh, second is, uh, 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 I was uh, um, surprised that one could keep building uh, lots or houses on a, on a lot that was already developed and uh, along with other members, I think of the board was interested in the, uh, the, 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 the part of the bylaw that gave, made this possible. Um, I, I looked in the, uh, in the application and I'm, I noted that uh, the application doesn't cite, uh, Chris, that 3.01. I, I think it, it's, it's, it, it's generally useful to uh, cite the section of the bylaw that you are asking for permission under. I had thought that's just a habit I got into. Um, so I, I was perplexed because I didn't know what section Bruce, of the bylaw was being leveraged here. You've told us that. Bruce, um, Bruce, I do, I do see that referenced on the application. Really? Yeah. I, I looked for it and I couldn't find it. Do I stand corrected? Thank you, Doug. I, 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 I did. I also, uh, in uh, looking, because it seemed that the, the phrase second, uh, second principle use, and I, scanned the, uh, the I searched the bylaw for mentions of the words uh, phrase second principle use and I could only find one I think so uh, it, I was confused by that as well because I couldn't see anywhere in the bylaw where second principle use was referred to in relation to residential properties um, of, of, of this nature. Um, possibly I'm, I wasn't very successful at that particular search either so um i was i was um i wanted to be enlightened as to um why and where as the second principle use was the trigger for or the basis for um making this uh, arrangement uh, acceptable okay chris do you want to comment on that yeah, um, the principal uses are the uses that are listed in section three. It's the um, use category table. What What is that called? I think it's just section three. So yeah. it includes yeah. all kinds of things. It includes apartments, it includes townhouses, it includes single family houses, it includes two family houses, it includes retail stores. So all of those things that are listed in section three in the category um, in the use category table, those are considered principal uses. So a two family house, if it's owner occupied or non owner occupied would be considered one principal use. A single family house would be considered one principal use. So in this case, Michael's going to be asking the Zoning Board of Appeals to um, make a finding that these two principal uses that are proposed to be allowed on this site are complementary to one another. And he'll have to make that argument to the zoning board. But we do have another case of a single family house. And I think it's on at the corner of where Halleck meets North Prospect Street. There's a property there that had a single family house. 
and the Zoning Board of Appeals granted a special permit in that case to add a duplex to that property. So again, um, the um, gateway to that was the fact that a special permit was required to put a duplex in. In this I see. case, the special mm -hmm. permit has allowed the duplex to be there. So now the door is open to another special permit to allow the single family to be there. But of course, these are all discretionary permits and the ZBA can grant this or not grant it. Okay, that that's interesting to Karen and myself, I guess, because we didn't realize at the time, but that was the Peace Place duplex that came before us at the local historic district commission. And we were asked to make findings of a different nature, but I hadn't realized there was a parallel between this project and, and one that Karen and I at least are already quite familiar with. Um, final question, I think, um, and this has to do with something that we may, uh, well, we'll see. Michael, the, the uh, existing house uh, at the front is a duplex. Is that correct? I, right. I think it is. And, and I know it's uh, because you've told us that it's uh, compliant so far as land use is concerned. The zoning board has approved the, uh, that it be a, a, um, a duplex. Um, do you know whether the, uh, the, the separation walls, that, that this, is a code, this is code compliant or is it grandfathered in some way? No, when I um, when we did the renovation on the house, uh, when we purchased it to convert it um, through the ZBA to a two family, uh, we were required to put a continuous firewall down the middle of it uh, from roof deck all the way to basement slab. OK, that's great, because so at the time, at the I'm sorry, at the time. So we, we had everything inspected um, through the building department to make sure that it met the requirements to have uh, to convert it to the duplex. Okay. I was going to suggest if that wasn't the case that we might recommend to the zoning board that they uh, make that a condition of uh, approval, but uh, clearly unnecessary. Um, my final comment is that I too would uh, uh, like to see as much as possible the, uh, the maintenance of owner occupancy uh, on this site that one of the buildings is owner occupied. And I guess, uh, um, uh, I mean, we're quite concerned with neighborhoods and so forth, as many people are in town, uh, becoming uh, um, uh, stu student occupied properties uh, with landlords that uh, don't care very much and, and allow uh, uh, things to go south. Uh, you're clearly, uh, and I can see by the plan that you've got that that back house is so completely designed for a family that it, it, it seems that the floor plan itself is probably driving owner occupancy for the longest time. But uh, I think uh, properties that uh, get densificated in this way in the village centers and so forth, it, it would be uh, very comforting to the neighborhood to know that uh, that this expansion of accommodations on this site uh, was tied to uh, the perpetual owner occupancy. All right, thank you, Bruce. And uh, while you were saying you were familiar with Mike, I was sort of realizing that I think Mike did some work for me at one point. I did, Doug. <laughs> you, you again. I, I'm not sure you had the beard at the time. Uh, I've had a beard uh, since I got married 18 years ago. That okay, so you I had saved, the beard, so and I just haven't I did, thought yeah. about you since you finished our, your work. Yeah. So welcome to town. Thank you. I think you lived uh, north of Greenfield when we were. Yeah, it was, uh, we moved from Bernardston up, yeah, in, okay. up in the woods. All right. Um, let's see, Janet, you had your hand up for a while. Did we, is that passed or uh, you're, you, are, you are muted, Janet? Um, I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I don't have a comment. Okay. All right. So the only, the only comment, uh, actually go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to note, Janet asked a question about whether there was enough lot area. I think it was Janet and I added up the lot area requirements and there's 15,000 for the first unit and 4,000 for each additional unit. So the total required is 23,000 and that's reflected in this little zoning table that's on the um, plan here. So I just verified that. And they, they have over 30,000 square feet on the property existing. So I just thought I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Janet? 
now I have a question. I just so I'm I'm wondering, um, Michael, like who your tenants are in the front? Have they been students? Are they um, older folk? Um, and then just if you just some if you have any observations on how many cars they have, because it's kind of a an endless inquiry we have about how many cars people need. Do students need one car per person and things like that? I just wondered what your experience has been. So. Uh, for, to answer the first part of your question, primarily our tenants have been students. Um, when we first renovated the house, uh, I had a young woman uh, with two children who had just, I think, just finished at UMass, who lived in our back apartment for, I think, close to five or six years, um, was a fantastic tenant. And then she bought a house in town and currently still lives in town. Um, the front part of our house, because it was multiple bedroom, uh, four bedrooms, um, we've always had four students living in it. Uh, we had several years where they were grad students uh, and a few years where they were undergrads. But I will say that we've always been very um, thorough with our process of selecting tenants and have never had any problems. I actually looked at town records or looked at the complaint records and was surprised that I actually had one noise complaint um, several years ago that I was un not made aware of. Um, but I think in the entire time we've owned the house, uh, that was the only complaint that was ever filed against our house. And like I said, I was completely unaware of it because if I had been, it would have been addressed. Um, but we didn't get any more after that. But they've, it's, it's been primarily students, but I've always made it very clear um, to any incoming tenants that there are still single family, uh, not a, there's single family homes behind our property, um, but we do have a family across the street and to the north of us, um, uh, the Valerios uh, occupy that home. So I've always made it very clear to them that this was not gonna be a, a student party house. Um, beyond that, uh, I think when we get approved for the special permit um, to convert it to a duplex, we were told to allow six parking places, um, I believe basically one per bedroom for the house. Uh, or we were allowed to, to um, provide six parking places, one per bedroom. Um, you can see on my map, I've actually, because I don't think I've ever had six cars at the house at any given time. Uh, currently I have two students um, living in, well, actually they're both graduates now, living in the back. Um, and there's one car there part-time for them. And then my family's currently living in the front house and we've got two vehicles. Um, although my oldest daughter's getting her license. So I expect a third vehicle sometime soon. Um, but there's, I don't think there's ever been more than four, four or five vehicles on the property at any time. Okay, thank you. And parking's never been an issue. We've always been able to contain our vehicles to our parking spots. Um, unlike some of the nearby homes on North Pleasant Street, um, directly to the south of us, we've, I think, we've, I mean, the neighborhood has changed quite a bit in the past 14 years since I've owned the home. Uh, when we bought it, there was an elderly couple that lived directly south of us, um, and the two houses south of that were owner-occupied. Now, all three of those are currently rental units. And parking does continue to be an issue at those residences. But I will say that it's never been an issue at ours because we have adequate parking in back of the house. Okay. okay. Uh, and Mike, I can't resist uh, I, one comment I might make about the house. Yep. And, and that is that the way it's configured now, the front door faces the side yep. of the uh, lot. You know, it kind of looks like a house that was designed to face the street and has been turned and, you know, made to fit on the lot. And if there were any, if, the, if there were any way to have the front door sort of face the driveway, um, you know, that might be more uh, appropriate for this, this situation. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just a comment uh, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't think it needs to be any part of any recommendation to the ZBA. Okay. Uh, I will um, comment that we were, because it was going to be a uh, single family owner occupied. Um, I was, we, we put the garage for obvious reasons on the west side of the house, yep. um, both to make ease of access to the garage um, easier and also as a slight buffer from the street. 
to the house. Yep. And as far as the entrance to the house, I realize it's basically facing the backyard of um, the house south of us, um, which isn't necessarily ideal. Uh, there is a row of trees there, and I do plan on adding more screening along that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that reconfigure because the the it's a long lot, and we've I've always sort of had this idea for what the first floor configuration of my house would be when we built it. We I built my house up in Berniston, you know, 16 years ago, but um, I always had an idea of what that first floor layout would be. And it fits a lot size wise. Um, yeah, I get that it looks like it's facing the wrong direction, but um, I think I wanted basically south the bulk of the windows on that side of the house, um, the, what would you would consider the front side of the house to be south facing. And I also wanted the roof to be configured for photovoltaic. Uh -huh. um, but it obviously makes sense because it's a long, long, narrower lot to position it that way as well. Yep. Okay. All right, um, I'm not seeing any more comments. Chris, I see your hand. So I understand that you have the recommendation that the property remain owner occupied. Were there other recommendations that you had for the zoning board? I wanted to ask about the owner occupied condition. Um, and, and I guess, Mike, does that concern you that if you whenever this property is sold that you might have a pretty small pool of buyers who are limited to being owner occupied but have to buy a two family duplex at the same time um i mean it does obviously any restrictions or limitations put on it um are not desirable um obviously you know down the road who knows what's going to happen 15 20 years from now um should we decide to sell uh, the property? Um, obviously it limits the number of potential buyers for it. Um, is there a market for a, you know, a, a decent size um, single family dwelling unit with uh, the benefit of the income of a duplex on the property? There is, but uh, it's certainly gonna limit buyers. We. I think as uh, Bruce mentioned earlier, the house was clearly designed uh, to be a single family, probably owner occupied home. If I was looking to put uh, an investment property that was gonna be a rental on the property, I certainly wouldn't have designed the living space the way I did on the first floor. Um, so it's a concern. I obviously would like to not have restrictions placed on it, not knowing what's gonna happen down the road, but um, I certainly, we have full intentions of staying in Amherst uh, for a decent amount of, you know, I've got, like I said, I've got, a, my son's entering fifth grade. So I've got at least eight years in the public school system in Amherst. And then I'll have three kids going through college and probably returning home. So I'm looking at, you know, potential 12 to 15 year plan. Um, what's going to happen 15 to 20 years from now? I couldn't even begin to tell you, because like I said, if you'd asked me, uh, 15 years ago, if I was going to be living in Amherst, I probably would have said no. Um, but we're glad to be here. So I'm okay with them with putting that restriction on it. Um, because it's um, certainly have no intention of doing otherwise right now. I would assume that if 15 years from now, we decided uh, to downsize and possibly look to sell the property that I could come before the zoning board again and ask that that restriction be removed. I'm gonna guess that the climate of the neighborhood, as I've said, it's changed dramatically in the last 15 years. I would expect that it'll probably change more over the next 15 years. Um, so I would think that I'd have the ability at least to go before the ZBA again, if we found the need to have that removed. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Janet. Um, I, I think it's important that the conditions stay on the house. And um, I don't, you know, like an owner occupied multifamily house is like the hottest thing in the Boston area. Cause it's a great way to um, get probably a bigger house than you expect. You have great tax benefits um, and you have income units. And so it, it's, it makes buying a house much more affordable. So I think that that market like isn't 
as strong here, but I think in 10 or 15 years, hopefully that will grow and that won't be seen as a bad thing, but actually be seen as a positive. But, you know, listening to Michael talk about the neighborhood changing, I think that it's really important that we stabilize and strengthen neighborhoods and not turn into sort of like, you know, houses with single family houses and, and families. We don't turn into um, a rental, you know, rental neighborhood for UMass students. And so I think that um, I, I hope that we as a board, and I personally really think that we need to stabilize neighborhoods and have a mix of housing types and not have a majority of students in a neighborhood because that will turn a neighborhood. And so I think I see the Holdens as doing a great thing and um, you know, strengthening this neighborhood, keeping it stable, income property, their family is there. And I, I do think we, I would really encourage to keep this idea. And I think it will get more popular in Amherst. But I've done it myself and it's a great way to finance something you can't really afford and have your tenants basically pay for your mortgage or most of it. So I just think this is really an important issue. For Amherst. All right. All right, Nate. Sure, thanks. I guess the question, you know, I'm wondering is, is the occupancy permit or requirement on the single family home or just on the property? So typically we would have an owner occupancy requirement on the property. So right, maybe the owner is in the front proper is in the front house, right? And not or front unit and not in the single family because they might want to rent that. Um, so, I, you know, I, Jana, when you said you, you know, you said occupancy of the single family home, and that's what they're saying in their special permit, but is the recommendation that or just that one of the units on the property be owner occupied? Actually, that's a great point, Nate. I would say on the property because they may, the Holdens as they get older might wanna move into the smaller units instead of having that big house. I know that problem too. All right, uh, Bruce. Uh, uh, I agree with Janet. I just, uh, I, I think uh, for clarity that yes, uh, the owner occupancy on the units and, you know, Michael's a builder and uh, he's got great capabilities of doing exactly what Janet suggests. And I can tell you for the last seven years, Michael, since I've retired, I'm, be, I'm now doing what you've been doing all your life. I've spent seven years making two houses for my kids. So uh, in your seventies, you're still going to be able to do it pretty much whatever you want. So uh, I can see it's very possible that you would uh, play with that property and it could be very different and much, much better because of who you are. So I'm welcome to town. Thank you. All right, so it sounds like we would recommend a condition of owner occupancy on the property and not directly tied to the new single family home. And I don't see any more hands. Uh, I'm not, I haven't heard any other sort of conditions we might recommend. Um, and I also don't see, I uh, wanted to know if there were any members of the public that wanted to make a comment on this. Uh, I would remind them that, that this will be coming before the zoning board and you can make comments at that time as well. And those comments are likely to be more uh, pertinent to their decisions, we're just doing a recommendation. So I don't see any hands from the attendees. So in that case, I think we can consider this topic closed. Chris, I now see your hand. Oh, I just wanted to know if you would um, recommend that this application be approved and that this condition be added. Do you okay. want to go that far to say that okay. you think the application should be approved? All right. So, uh, Janet, what would you would you agree with that? You know, I I am um, I wouldn't recommend approval because I think that I would leave it to the ZBA to decide about complementary uses. And then nine point two two is, as you know, I find it very disturbing provision and kind of unclear. So I I don't feel like I'm in a position to to say yeah, go ahead. But I do think it's an attractive project. It's a really beautiful building. It's going to help the neighborhood, and you know. I see, I see lots of benefits to it, but I defer to the ZBA. All right, Bruce. Again, uh, Janet says what I was thinking. Uh, I, uh, uh, with a small a, I definitely approve of this from the point of view that I see as the purview of the planning board and so forth. And I did look at the master plan so far as this was concerned, and it seems to be consistent with what did I write here, uh, section 4.8, you know, the residential and densification of neighborhoods and doing uh, densi densification this way. So from from 
our point of view, let's, if I can be so bold as to uh, um, uh, propose for, uh, for the board, or the, or the sort of things that I imagine the board would be supporting, I, I think this is uh, very supportable. But, but I, I, I understand that the zoning board is asked to look at things slightly differently. Uh, that's why they're them and we're us. So again, I, like Janet, I wouldn't say recommend approval because I think that's their business, but uh, I, I think, uh, I would say that uh, I would be happy for uh, Chris to represent a positive uh, reception uh, from, certainly from me okay. on this project. All right, thank you. Karen, do you want to make a comment on this? Would you, in favor okay. of recommending approval or just leaving it to the board? Uh, I agree. I think this is a, a positive thing happening in, in North Amherst. And uh, I would not, um, I, Janet and Bruce said exactly what I feel. Okay. Um, I'm for it, but leave it to the zoning board. All right. And I won't object to that taking that position so i guess it's if they approve it we recommend a owner, owner occupancy provision on the property bruce is your hand a legacy hand or uh or do you want to speak again okay all right so uh thank you mike uh Appreciate your coming in. This was uh, on an optional, an additional board conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. All right. So the time now is 7:25, and we will move on to item four, which is a site plan review uh, of a SPR 2020. Dash zero three with Jonathan Gerfine for Riverside Organics at 555 Belchertown Road. A review of certain changes to the site plan under condition number seven of the site plan review, including placement of concrete blocks in the driveway and parking lot. For a marijuana product manufacturer and marijuana micro business under section 3.363.5 of the zoning bylaw, map 18D, parcel two in the PRP zoning district. Chris, why don't you start us off? Yes, I noticed that Mr. Gerfine isn't here tonight. Um, I was hoping he would be, I invited him to come. But in any event, um, the issue is that uh, Mr. Gerfine had his um, property uh, approved by the planning board back a couple of years ago to house a, a micro business growing marijuana and he wasn't going to um, do any retail sales on the property he was going to transfer the marijuana to another entity that would then sell it off-site um, and so he got approval for his site plan which you have received in your packet and maybe we could show that site plan um, <clears throat> but then um, it turned out that he added a few things. Um, he did talk to the planning board back in, I think it was 2019 when this came before the planning board. He talked to the planning board about placing concrete blocks in the driveway. He talked about placing two concrete blocks in the driveway. And I think the reason for those was to keep people from being able to enter and exit the property quickly. He didn't want to, um, Thank you, this is a good plan. He didn't want to have people be able to come in and out very quickly. So he placed these two concrete blocks in the driveway. They're about 16 feet, nine inches apart. They're not shown on the plan, but he did talk to the planning board about it. And it's um, on page one of his um, planning board decision. So um, then um, a resident drove by on Paul Drive, I think it was, um, on on her way to the uh, Valley Medical Center and noticed the two blocks in the driveway and felt that those were potentially dangerous and suggested that um, we might want to require that um, Mr. Griffin put some kind of reflectors on the blocks to let people know that they were there to make them more obvious. And so that, um, complaint, if you will, came into the 
inspection services department. And so Rob Morris sent one of the inspectors out and the inspector noticed that in addition to the concrete blocks in the driveway, there were also concrete blocks placed um, closer to the building, the new building. Um, and six of them were placed along the driveway and two and four of them were placed close to the building. I think, Pam, do you have access to that drawing that I sent out yesterday that shows, yeah, that's it. Okay, so um, this shows um, Porter Drive and Hall Drive. It, this isn't really called Porter Drive anymore. It's all called Hall Drive. Uh, there's a crosswalk there so people can cross over and walk to Valley Medical from Route 9. Route 9 is at the top of the page. Um, and then uh, a little ways in from the crosswalk are these two blocks that Mr. Gerfine had talked to the planning board about. They're about two feet wide and three feet long and two feet high. So they're a little bit smaller than the average Jersey barrier and they're also more compact. Um, so then uh, this drawing also shows that there are six blocks placed along of similar size placed along the driveway um, that is within the fenced in area around the building. And I guess I should describe for Bruce and Karen, and I think Janet was on this um, planning board when this was approved, and maybe maybe Janet wasn't on, and maybe Doug wasn't on. No, so. I don't remember, remember uh, being hearing about this property before. Okay, well, um, so he has he had an existing building there that was an old radio station. Um, and some of you who have lived in Amherst for a long time will remember that radio station. So that's the building that's shown to the right. And he's refurbished that building and painted it. Um, and then he's added a greenhouse to the left. And the greenhouse is going to be you know, state of the art, temperature controlled, um, everything controlled about it, including microbes that aren't allowed into it, et cetera. Um, it's taken him a long time, obviously, from the time he got this thing approved, which was sometime in the winter of uh, 2020, um, to now he's had difficulties with the state getting his um, approval. Um, so in any event, this is still under construction. So he's placed these six blocks along the driveway and he's placed four blocks against the wall of the greenhouse. And what he told me was that he placed the blocks inside the fence along the driveway and, and next to the greenhouse to protect those, <clears throat> to protect the greenhouse. He doesn't want people who come in here, namely, you know, probably delivery people to bump into things. But the problem is that the four blocks along the um, greenhouse actually are in the place of where the dumpster should be. Um, and he doesn't have a dumpster there yet. So I guess, if I were to recommend something to you, I would recommend that you go ahead and approve the two blocks in the driveway because he did talk to you about those, even those, though they weren't on the plan originally, and that you could suggest to him or require that he put some kind of reflectors on them to make them more visible to people um, who might come into the driveway. But that once construction is finished on the building, that he remove the blocks that are within the fenced area. Um, because those are, you know, really not something that he talked to you about and they weren't something that he showed on the plan. Um, let's see if I have anything else to say about that. Um, so I have been in touch with him a few times and um, I offered to go out and, and do the measurements and, and make this drawing so it would make it easier for him to explain what he was doing here. Unfortunately, he uh, didn't come tonight, but the essential idea is can you approve these two blocks as a, well, the two blocks were a part of the decision. They were written into the decision. Can you, so I guess <laughs> the question is, what do you want to do here? That's, that's <laughs> All right, what do we want to do? Janet. Thanks. So I think I'm the only person on the planning board that was here during this, as I remember, like many hearings um, about this project. And so, Chris, it sounds like it's not operational yet. That's what you're saying? Not operational yet, nope. Okay, and um, so I went out and looked at the this here, and I, I, I'm sorry I didn't take a photograph because I thought that the two blocks 
were at the um, entry fence. Are there two blocks by the entry fence? Because that's what no. I see. Because so, so when I so just you know full disclosure, I have several times driven down this this Porter Way, um, kind of messing up going to um, Valley Medical, and so I don't see that as a driveway. I see that as a road. Um, and then when I looked on the map and the pictures, it is a road. And so when, so I, I realized when I read your report, I was like, oh, that, you know, that's his driveway. And then I got out there and I said, this is a road, this isn't his driveway. And so um, I do find them a, a strange place. It seems like he's put two blocks on a road that people could easily and accidentally go towards. Um, I'm not even quite sure why they're there in a way, because you know, it seems to me that he could put blocks in front of the actual entryway um, to his thing. So I, I thought they were strange. I thought they were in the middle of a road and it's not his driveway. So that's kind of an issue to me is like, is this a road or is this his driveway? Um, the other question I had was like, does the town clear that road? Does, you know, Porter Drive? And could the fire trucks, you know, if two or three fire, uh, two, two or three trucks came in, could they maneuver around? Because one of the things we learned about growing um, marijuana in a greenhouse is there's a lot of carbon dioxide, there's a lot of energy um, being used. And so, um, you know, the idea of having a fire was one of the considerations um, as is in every situation, but there's a lot of electricity going into that unit or it will be someday. So, so my questions were basically, is that a driveway or is that a, a road or a private road? And then um, if he could just maybe, if he wants to use those blocks to stop people from quickly gaining access to his property, it makes sense to put it near the entryway, the entry fence, probably achieving the same thing. And hopefully, and then the question is, is he blocking the road for street clearing or, or fire trucks or whatever? So it just seemed very, when I went out there and looked, I wish I had taken a picture because I sort of mentally remember. I can bring up the pictures that Chris sent us. Did we? They're in the packet. Yep. Yeah. Or you sent them in the email yesterday. Chris. Oh, that's right. They're in the email that I sent yesterday. Yep. Should I do that? Mm -hmm. Mary is a strange nice. thing. All right. So here's photo one. I don't know if you can see. Can't see it. Oh, there. Yep. Let's so that see. shows the that shows the blocks within the fence. Yeah. So that's photo one. And then I'll stop share and share photo two. Here we go. And view. There we go. There's the blocks. I mean, does this pavement joint, does that suggest that's the end of the public way? No. It's, it's so, not sorry. a public way. It's Porter Drive is not a public way. Neither is Hall Drive. Um, the, the town may accept Hall Drive as a public way at some point because it leads to Valley Medical. I don't think the town has an intention of accepting Porter Drive. It's just a paper street, really. Um, okay. So that's what this is, Porter All Drive. All right. So, so it probably does not get plowed by the town. I don't think so. And would the fire department have any opinion about these blocks or not? They may. The, um, you know, I, I just want to say that the blocks are put on the property line. So, you know, essentially they're, uh, you know, 555 Old Belchertown Road owns the rest of the pavement where the red car is and what everything behind these blocks. And so Chris is right that it was paved originally um, as a turnaround to access the radio station and perhaps if Porter Drive was ever developed into a subdivision, but that didn't happen. And so, you know, it's just a relic of, you know, when it was um, first developed. So the blocks are on the property line, you know, marking what is um, Jonathan's property. So, you know, they're more than wide enough for an emergency vehicle. I talked to the building commissioner. So okay. delivery trucks can still make it through. It's really, I think, you know, supposed to be a visual cue that it's not a road or something, right? So, um, you know, whether or not, like Chris said, 
striping or another sign or something could indicate that. But I think that's the intention of it, not to prevent veh vehicular traffic because on the site plan where the car is, there's supposed to be three parking spaces beyond, you know, next to the, you know, three, including that red car, two more parking spaces on the pavement. So what's the remaining pavement on the site would be used for parking. And uh, there's plenty of room for vehicles to go back and forth between those blocks. Yeah, it looks like there's more than 20 feet. Mm -hmm. There's 16, point, 16 feet, nine inches between the blocks. I measured okay. it. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I, th I think the question for the planning board is whether these changes are de minimis to the site plan and can they be administratively approved or is it, you know, a significant enough change that it, the site plan needs to be amended? Which right, would so, involve a public hearing. Right. right. Well, I mean, I guess, uh, Karen, you've got your hand up. I'll let you go next. Um, I actually drove there because this seemed so strange and it was so hard to understand reading this. And I was shocked at these, these uh, dangerous looking, ugly looking like East Berlin border things in the middle of the, uh, of the road. And I do see the point of whoever said, uh, you know, there they are at the moment and somebody at night could really damage their car or, and, and they're, they're far enough apart so that they don't hinder any kind of traffic going through there. Um, so for the public, it's, it's just this weird thing, these two ugly things dropped in front of this, this uh, building, but I wasn't part of what you approved before. And, and it's interesting that his reason for that is just, just somehow make it clear that this is not public and uh, and people shouldn't be racing around. But, you know, there, there should be, there's a fence around the building to protect the building, it looks like. Um, it's extremely unesthetic. Um, yeah, that, that's just my outsider uh, opinion of this. I can see the public wondering what we're approving here. Okay, uh, Bruce. I agree with Karen, uh, but I also recognize that the uh, that the decision says that um, he uh, um, that the, the 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 private road which leads to the property will be partially barricaded with cement blocks at the entrance to his property. So the uh, well, it's not on the plan. It was pretty specifically stated, and therefore approved. So it seems to me that this is certainly, uh, uh, it, 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 at most, a de minimis change, uh, if not simply uh, an inconsistency in the documents. Because uh, you know we deal with, uh, for example, specifications and, and drawings where something is said in one document but isn't repeated in the other, uh, and you say, well, the the you know the the, the 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 document that makes the case uh, is 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 good for all. So I, I would say that this is clearly a de minimis change, if if even that. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's ugly and and seemingly pointless. And uh, uh, but but am I not right that this is a this is water under a bridge? Well, I, I mean, I guess the blocks at the entry seem, like you said, they were mentioned in the conversation when the applicant got his permit. The, uh, I think Chris is more concerned, maybe if I can put words in your mouth, uh, about the blocks that are inside that are in the way of, the, of where the dumpster was to be located, which kind of begs the question of where does he plan to put it if he leaves those blocks yeah. in place. Well, that uh, I, I feel like the, the, it's de minimis or less. Uh, um, I, for, I, for, the, uh, for the blocks on the road, but I, I agree that the, the blocks, the other, the, other, the other 10 blocks, I guess six and four, are not de minimis. They weren't mentioned and they weren't on the plan and they're taking the place of something that should be. So that seems okay. to be clear that that would require um, a reconsideration. Okay. 
But All the right. the ones on the road, I would like to imagine that even though it's uh, that whether we can have another bite of the cherry and at least do something to make them you paint them or put some markers on them or even take some of the blocks. I mean, I think it would look better if he put two or three of those blocks along there um, so that it, it didn't look like somebody just dumped something there pointlessly. I mean, if you had three blocks instead of one either side, even and then you could put a sign on that said private property or, or something, that would be more intelligent. It would be more, I mean, it would be better. Um, can we make that suggestion? We can certainly suggest pretty much anything. <laughs> okay, nope. I get. Okay, so um, Janet. So um, the, I think we had like four or five hearings with Mr. Griffin that just, you know, it was kind of a, um, let me say kindly, an unorganized application. Um, and it was also the first time we had seen anything like this. And so I don't really feel like the planning board okayed two cement blocks sitting in the middle of the road. And so it wasn't on the site plan. Um, I don't think of this as the driveway. And so I, I think that, um, you know, he mentioned this in the beginning. And I think, I don't think we were focusing on this is where on the private way his property begins, and this is where the cement blocks are. So I, I you know, I don't want to go back into all those hearings, but I don't, I don't, I don't think this is something that we would agree with if we had seen it then, and we don't really agree with it now. And I, I understand that Mr. Griffin is trying not to call attention to his facility um, and is very concerned about security. And so I could see why he doesn't want a lot of people driving up, perhaps a person like me, thinking I'm going to Valley Medical and I'm not. So I wonder if there's a better way for him to mark this as private property, you know, and a way that's safer, because to me, this looks really unsafe. It's just they're low, they're gray. At night, they're not going to be very visible. Um, I could see easily someone driving into it. So I'm not sure the board said, yeah, two cement blocks in the middle of the private way. That's where your property starts, you know. And so I, I think that maybe, you know, the landscape architects and architects would have picked that up if they had seen it. But I, I, I'm not crazy about it's not just an aesthetic thing. I think they're dangerous and I think they're not really achieving what he wants, which is to delineate this as private property and people aren't really invited. All right, uh, Karen. I, I know he said somewhere in his uh, application that he was going to, I think it was with the fence and the gate that he was amenable to making it as aesthetically pleasing as possible. And I think also the board said that grass has to be mowed and it has to have neat appearance. So I think one should just bring up the fact that this is about as ugly as it gets. And is he open to, does he have any ideas? Um, can he put planters around them and accomplish the same thing? And, um, you know, just so we don't have this, this bomb shelter effect at that part <laughs> is my recommendation. All right. Thank you, Karen. So Chris, it sounds like uh, the majority of the board would like to have Mr. Uh, whatever, whatever his Griffin, Griffin uh, return, and um, we don't, we may, we may or may not consider the two blocks on the entry to be de minimis, but we would like to have a conversation about the blocks inside as not being de minimis, and um, while we're talking with him, we're going to want to talk about the two blocks that are at the entry and discuss alternative ways for him to mark his boundary in a way that's more pleasing. Thank you. And Nate, I see you're, you've taken- Yeah, I just, I just shared my screen. screen. This is, this is a tw the 2021 aerial photograph. And so, you know, there's a crosswalk now. And so, you know, here's um, Route 9, here's Hall Drive, and it takes, you know, almost a 90 degree turn up to the medical center and here's here's the greenhouse being built and here's um you know the blocks are essentially right here so you know if we're talking about how to change how the road feels i mean i feel like just the nature of how it's the road itself turns it's hard to change that you know if this were only if this if quarter drive was never going to be developed i don't think they would have done this type of 
corner here, right? So you're, they're, they're leading you into straight and then you're taking such a turn. And so, you know, unless we're asking the applicant to change, you know, cut out pavement and, you know, remove curbing or like, you know, Corinne said planters or something else, um, which isn't immediately at the property boundary, right? So there's some, some area behind the crosswalk that's still um, not on the property. You know, I, I mean, I feel like we, I, I'd like to know if there's suggestions to the applicant in terms of how to do that. So, if, you know, we'd be asking them for an amended site plan and we'd want to have as much information as possible up front. So what, you know, what could we recommend or suggest to the applicant to do that? That's all. All right, uh, Bruce. Um, in response to what you said, Nate, uh, recommendations, uh, it occurs to me that he's got uh, 10 additional blocks that he uh, has got to do something with. And uh, I would say that uh, expressing the concerns that have been uh, expressed and, 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 and I'm particularly uh, swayed by what Janet says because she was, uh, she was there and, and I wasn't. So that, uh, um, and I, I did a marijuana facility years ago in Connecticut and I understand how discombobulated those people are. I mean, it's, they're just hopeless. So if it was anything like I had to deal with, I can well understand uh, what you said, uh, how you must have felt, Jen. But uh, apropos of what you say, Nate, um, I would simply say uh, on the basis of what we've got at the moment, and since he didn't, he chose not to come, so we, we don't, have, don't have much to work with, but what we do have is uh, 10 additional blocks and a problem at the entry, which is currently, um, is, is inappropriately uh, resolved with a couple of silly blocks. So I would say, um, think about how you can use those other 10 blocks and some um, plants perhaps, or colors or signage or reflectors or, or whatever uh, imaginative thing that can be done with those 10 plus two blocks to make, uh, to solve the problem uh, that he has with that um, strange entry there. All right. Uh, Chris, I think your was, yours was the next hand that popped up. Well, I wanted to say thank you to Bruce for mentioning how discombobulated some of these applicants can be. And this particular applicant is particularly discombobulated. So I just wanted to say that because I will transmit the information that you have told me and suggested. I'm just not entirely sure that we're going to get a satisfactory resolution. So if we don't get a satisfactory resolution, I think that what's going to happen is that the inspection services department is going to require him just to remove all the blocks. Anyway, I just wanted to state that. Yep. All right. Uh, Janet. So I, I was going to say that I thought Mr. Griffin was, you know, very open to suggestions and flexible. So I think he would um, probably prefer to make adjustments without the formal opening of the hearing. And that maybe, you know, the suggestion is to put more cement blocks there and paint them a color that would be easily seen by motorists day or night because they kind of match the street. So I think, you know, my impression is that he was open to suggestions because it's his first, you know, facility. Okay. I will say that the blocks, at least in the photos, look like they're fairly light in color. So I'm not particularly worried about them being missed at night. Um, I do agree they're not, you know, attractive at all. Um, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was to that he extend his uh, black chain link fence out from from the from the enclosure he's got so that it, it can come out and, and come part way onto the roadway. But that's darker and less visible than the blocks he's got. So that's probably not safe. Um, he, he also wants delivery trucks to come to the fence and be seen on a camera and then to talk to them. So he doesn't he doesn't want people coming close to the facility without being kind of vetted. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the right answer is to cut away some pavement, probably put in some concrete curbing and you know, better define that as an entrance off of a roadway rather than a continuation of Hall Drive, which is what it looks like now. So I don't know whether that's, that's probably not feasible. 
Um, but you know, taking additional concrete blocks and lining them up along there gets us closer to the sort of bomb shelter aesthetic that Karen mentioned, in my opinion. So I'm I'm not crazy about that answer, but you know, every time I I, I go into Hall Drive to the doctor there, and um, you know, every time I go past that, it looks like it's an abandoned section of roadway that just never got built out. So uh, I agree, it's an eyesore. I'm surprised that the guys at Valley Medical haven't, uh, you know, asked him to do something about it. <laughs> Curious. I think whatever we ask him to do has to be really simple and straightforward and don't leave it up to him to figure it out. So okay. if you have some specific things, if you'd like to meet with him, I can try again to get yeah. him to come and meet with you. But if you have specific things that you want him to do, I think that will be more easily. Um, well, I, I guess one other thought I had was I think a couple of Jersey barriers would feel less what strange. Um, and, and they also would have fewer sharp corners that feel like that I'm going to scratch my car on them. Um, so that if he had a couple of Jersey barriers and those replaced the blocks, um, I personally, I feel like that would be a less threatening uh, configuration. Bruce. Um, uh, I, I'll I'll take issue. I'll, I'll not take issue. I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll make make an argument, Doug, uh, as to okay. why those uh, blocks uh, could be better. It, it does take a little bit of imagination, and, and Chris has kind of uh, stuck a spanner in my spoke on that one. But let's say I, I'm I'm thinking of twelve blocks. I imagine they can be stacked. Um, so I imagine that you could do two blocks and two blocks. Um, and then on the other side, two and two, and then they could, uh, he could attach uh, two or three um, pieces of wood horizontally to those that would uh, soften the, uh, the look uh, considerably, particularly if the blocks were then painted uh, out so that they were painted dark so you didn't see them and you had just had the wood. And, and that would be pretty straightforward and it would make a big difference and it would look better. Can you draw that? I sure can. I can show it to him and say, here's what the planning board would like you to do. Well, uh, are people comfortable with uh, uh, what I just said and that it, it would represent? Uh, Janet seems to think it's OK. <laughs> Not my yeah. area. Look, I will, I will do that uh, over break. And I will, uh, uh, I will send it to, to you in 10, 15 minutes. All right. Well, if you want to send it to me, I mean, I don't know. Um, can one of you post it or share the screen after break? Pam or um, Nate could do that. I'll, I'll send it to Pam. I've got her email address. I think I, think I do. I'm, maybe send I don't. Send I, it. Yes, send I see. It Nate. I'll send it to Nate. I know, I, I know Nate can get stuff from me. I did, I'm not logged into my work computer, so you would have to send it to my personal. Well, I mean, you and can send it to me and I could post, I could share the mm -hmm. screen again. Yeah. Send it to both of you. All right. Um, well, with that, maybe we want to take our break and give Bruce a, cup, a chance to draw. Um, <laughs> I think we're, we're close to the end of this topic. And uh, the next, I think the main thing we have remaining is the, the design standards comments. So uh, why don't we do that? Well, why don't we just take a break? And um, so the time now is 7.57. And uh, given that Bruce has got uh, some homework, let's make it a 10 minute break. Ooh. And we'll uh, come back at 8.07 and see if Bruce has finished sketching. All right, so turn off your phone, mute your... Uh, Mute your microphone and we'll come back at eight, 10 after or seven minutes after eight. Thank you.
Okay, the time is nine minutes after eight. So I'm hoping folks will reconvene. I see Bruce has already got his hand up. Maybe he's having a problem. He had his <laughs> hand up when he shut when down. He, when he shut down, so it's, I could just lower that. All right. He'll probably never volunteer again. <laughs> just sketching on the move. Yeah. It's a good idea, though. I had no idea how I would transmit what Bruce said to this person, Mr. Uh -huh. Fine. So I think it was a good idea to do the sketch. And I think it probably. I guess you can't start up again till Bruce comes back because he makes he the quorum. Completes my quorum, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, he's got his he's got his hostage, huh? We could talk about something other than planning board business. <laughs> Nate and I could tell you that we met with the Crest team today. And that oh, was yeah. that was great. It was really interesting. We had a two hour meeting with them and we told them about what we do and they told us a little bit about what they expect to be doing. And then they also asked us a lot of questions. So it was a good opportunity to meet them and to, um, you know, kind of become familiar with each other and let them know how we might be able to help them and vice versa. And um, yeah, it was a good, good meeting. So I was glad to be a part of it. And I wanted to thank Nate for being there. Good. It looks like we got Bruce back. So Bruce, I think we need you to I sent the drawing to both you, Doug, and to uh, Nate. All right. Which is uh, basically. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. OK. Yep. Yeah. So it hasn't come through yet for me. Oh, OK. Well, then I'll, I'll keep it here then. Yeah. So. Basically, I imagine you can stack those. I didn't look closely at the photograph to verify that, uh, but it would seem logical that uh, one would be able to stack things like that. And, and uh, there are 12 of them. Uh, so uh, he could... Uh, well, there, we oh, there we go. Bruce, uh, Nate brought it up on screen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, you could put them closer together and and uh, have more stacks. Oops, am I, am I muted? No. Yeah. Um, and the 16 foot two could be preserved or it could be narrowed. Uh, I mean, there's some uh, flexibility there, but I think that it doesn't take much imagination to figure out what you could do with that. The, the boards probably should be pressure treated because they're outside and they'll be screwed to blocks. So there'll be they'll be permanently wet behind it. I mean, you could do clever things, just use ordinary timbers and put some washers or something. So you've got spaces and they would drain out and then you would have more flexibility in terms of being able to paint them and stain them. And you'd use different width boards. You could put a sign on it that said, uh, you could space them differently so that you could uh, 
the top you get a three instead of two, four instead of three you could you could space the top two closer and the bottom one further and use the top two for a sign so there's lots of variations but, but uh, pretty basically uh, you could even do what Heron wants, which I would too. You could uh, hang uh, planters from it, or you could put a tub behind it, or you could do all sorts of things. Once you've got that there, uh, it would look better than those two blocks. Okay. It looks so much better than those two silly blocks, which are, I, I can see why people would, you get, we're going to get lots of, com not complaints even, but just questions. You know, people are going to be calling the, the, the DPW to find out whether that's a problem and serious and stuff, at least this will make it look as though somebody did something intentional and people won't call in uh, reporting a, a block that got dropped off a truck or something. Great. Yeah, I think this does look much better. Uh, Janet or Karen, any objections to this? Should we let Chris send this off to, to the owner and have them say this is what we'd like them to do. Karen, yeah. I see your your hand. Yeah, I am I am I can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Yeah, I Bruce, you're wonderful. Very talented and on the spot. Um I think maybe uh Chris when you talk to him, you, I, I don't know if uh Bruce you're amenable to that, have him get in touch with Bruce. And you could suggest things. I'm, I'm sure he's concerned about costs and wants to do this uh, as inexpensively as possible, but it, it really is a much, much better solution. And uh, I would also say maybe at some point, he, there should be just some, some uh, paintings on the driveway, just a line, um, you know, just like an ordinary street line, those yellow lines in the middle showing that this, that the, that this is not the way that you go, that this is private. Um, and that would also help. All right, Chris, I see your hand. Um, did you have suggestions about what to do about the blocks inside the fence? Uh, well, yes, bring them outside the fence and stack them up. Well, I think he, if he wants to deviate from the site plan that was approved, that has the dumpster in the area of those blocks inside the fence, and and he wants to leave some of the blocks that he doesn't need out here, he he should come back to us. Okay, so if he wants to leave any blocks inside the fence, he needs to come back. But if he wants to use those blocks to create this new barrier or delineation, then you're okay with it. You're okay with him bringing those blocks out. In yeah. any event, you want those blocks to come out from inside the fence. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody disagree with that? I think, you know, I mean, basically we don't know where the dumpster is going to go at the moment. So we'd like to find that out. Yes, it's shown on the plan, the original plan that was approved and it's shown in the location of one of these blocks. Right. So, okay, thanks. I will try to get that message across. All right. Okay, well, thank you, Bruce, for your quick work. All right, so the time now is 8.18, and we'll go on to the fifth item on the agenda, which is the downtown design standards. And um, I think, Nate, is there anything you want to say before you hear from comments from the board? No, I mean, I can share my screen and walk through the document. Um, you know, I'll thank everyone for the comments received. We heard, you know, we heard from the planning board and members of the public. Uh, we did speak with the new director of DEI, Pamela Young. And so we incorporated some of, some of her comments. Um, she also had suggestions for firms that could be, um, this could be sent to. Uh, I sent it to the procurement um, officer and also to other town staff and I'm waiting to hear comments. So, you know, I think once, you know, if the planning board has any more comments or there's public comments, we can incorporate them. You know, typically, uh, you know, um, accounting and finance might look at it. The procurement um, um, officer might look at it just to make sure that the comparative review criteria are 
are clear and make sense because really you want to have a proposal that fits into one category and not both, right? So if, or if we think like the years of experience are too, too stringent, um, you know, those might be changed, but, you know, typically they don't, you know, if they see something that doesn't make sense in the narrative or scope of services, they might call it out as well. But, you know, I'm, I'm having them look at it for kind of general structure and, you know, does it make sense in terms of how to select a, you know, a proposal? Um, okay. All yeah. right. Well, if you want, if, if you would like to go through it, I mean, I had several comments and, I'm, and you, I can mention them when you get to those sections. Sure. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now, so I'm hoping that's visible. Yes. The, uh, yeah, so, you know, the introduction, you know, didn't change much. I, I will say, you know, where there's track changes is what was changed. You know, um, in this third paragraph here, we say the standards will be incorporated by reference and that's parenthetical. And then in the scope of services, you know, it says to, to format the standards as if it were going in, into a bylaw or as, you know, its own document that is, that is referenced. And so there's a difference there in that if it's a document that's referenced by the bylaw, um, you know, the document can change without actually having to change zoning, right? So if you periodically update the, the design standards or guidelines, then it's not actually changing, changing the zoning you know, the reference is there. And so the document itself doesn't um, change. And so, you know, we haven't made that decision. What's the best way? We're hoping the consultant has some ideas. Um, at the, the different communities I've looked at, I've probably looked at about two dozen communities and they do it many different ways. Some do it by reference, some incorporate it, some have it in their general bylaw. So, you know, I, I think there's probably, you know, there's probably a few ways to do that. I think that's, you know, something that, you know, as a decision-making point, um, you know, at the end of the introduction, um, you know, there was some, you know, some comments about, you know, really describing Amherst a little bit more in terms of that it is a college town, that it's important. Uh, you know, we talked about that. We value sustainability and DEI, and we really want the standards to reflect that, you know, and, you know, allow new development, but be compatible with historic buildings. So, you know, everything that's, in uh, red, I don't know, I'm assuming it's red and blue are the new changes. Nate, um, my only comment, I had two comments on this page. Um, the, first of all, the last line of the second paragraph, um, while also providing standards that respond to and reflect the historic architecture, mm -hmm. um, I probably would delete and reflect. Mm -hmm. Uh, and simply say that the standards should respond to the historic architecture. Um, you know, I mean, we're not trying to get people to right. rebuild, you know, in a historic style, as far as I know. Um, right. And so I thought that was adequate. And then um, under the next paragraph, um, let's see. It, I was I was uh, a little I was wondering about the the first sentence about having the standards reflect community values of sustainability as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I was having trouble coming, kind of thinking of an example of how diversity, equity, and inclusion would be shown in it or included in a standard of this type, since it's fairly. Most of them are fairly neutral and more about physical than, uh, you know, sort of cultural or uh, behavioral sorts of issues. Um, I know we want a process that's inclusive and and allows you know a wide variety of uh, constituencies to participate, but I was just uh, not sure how this you know how that would happen. Have you seen examples? Yeah, no, not, not necessarily. I think you know the 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 following statement or two tries to kind of explain that a bit more, right? So sometimes it may not be the standards. You know, it's that the standards are creating spaces, right, where things can happen. So it may be that um, you know, unless we're starting to talk more about public art or right, maybe some other things that the standards themselves may not. Um, 
a draft. So, right, typically design standards, um, you know, may not get to that level of detail, right? I mean, that becomes really all encompassing if you're having standards that try to bring in some of that. I, you know, it was a, you know, I, I agree in the process, we do mention, um, you know, the outreach plan and, right, we want the process to be inclusive. I think if, you know, if others have comments about that, I mean, I, it, it could be something that is hard to explain. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, I, you know, you've looked at a lot more of these than I have, and I just wasn't sure how that would manifest itself in the standards. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Janet. I think you could, you know, I mean, if you're using diversity, e equity, inclusion as sort of co like a substitute for sort of um, people of color, I, I sort of read that more broadly that we wanted our downtown to include lots of people and different residents and different economic um, levels, not just, you know, you know, wealthy people or all students. And so I think there's in the master plan a value that all the neighborhoods are mixed in, in all sorts of ways. And so I kind of read that more broadly. Um, I think you could say community values, but that's kind of vague. So, um, you know, I think we want all different types of people using downtown and not just it for one group or another mm -hmm. type of thing. That's what I, I, I saw that more broadly. Um, Doug, can I ask you a question? So I had questions, some like, comments on the first page. Should we just do you want to go through all your things and then we all go one? No, by no. One? I was I I I thought we were just going to go through it page by page and give our comments as we do that. I have I had no comments on the first page, so if you did, we can go back and catch up. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Thank you. So, on, on, I was kind of confused by the define the boundaries of town center and why we. It seemed like I that showed up a couple of times in the RFP and it seemed like an odd thing to kick to the consultant to decide. And it didn't seem to me that it was that up for grabs. And I do think we have a, a kind of a unique town center in that there's a lot of constraints. We have like a cemetery on one part. We have Amherst College kind of hugging a lot of it. Um, you know, there's not, it's not the only place it could really expand would be into, you know, residential neighborhoods. And so I, I kept on seeing that and I kept on running why like, are you looking for a recommendation from the consultant to expand it? Or don't we know where the downtown is? Or um, so, so that was one thing. Um, in the beginning, I think in the third paragraph, you talked about parking strategies, which kind of got my, you know, I was like, oh, you know, maybe they'll be looking at like design or where parking should go. And then I didn't see that carried through. So I wondered if that's what we're really asking the consultant to do is, you know, what are we really asking to do in terms of parking strategies or locations or the look of parking? So that that thread wasn't carried through. And I know it's a huge area of concern for people. And then the other thing I thought was sort of big was that another constraint on the downtown is it's surrounded by three different historic districts and has some of the most iconic and the downtown itself has the most historic buildings in Amherst, or at least the ones that are most photographed and presented by the town and there's no protection for those buildings. And so I thought that should be mentioned early that there's the Emily Dickinson Historic District. I'm gonna mess up the names, Lincoln Sunset one, and then um, the other newer one. And so that just seems to be sort of something that should come out early as well as, you know, it, it some of the most historic buildings in Amherst, you know, the churches and town hall are in the town center. All right, so that's three items. Nate, do you want to respond to any of those at this time? Sure. Yeah, I think you know we do want the consultant to develop the design, the area where the design standards would apply. So we're not asking them to define the town center. We're saying define the area of the you know the design standard. So we're not limiting this to just the BG or BL. And so I agree that it could extend into the residential neighborhoods. And okay. it could go north up to UMass or south down to, you know, if they think it could go to, um, you know, Route 9. And I think the importance there is, uh, you know, in, in this, we're saying, you know, that there could be different, it could encompass different zoning districts. And we'd expect that there'd be different standards for those different areas. And so, um, you know, it may not be just commercial um, standards that we're looking for. We would want the design standards to apply to, you know, if there's, redevelopment on Halleck Street, for instance, you know, is what, what does that look like? Because that is adjacent to, you know, the North Pleasant Street and the commercial core. So 
it's really not. Um, so, you know, that's what staff would like. We'd like the consultant to, you know, have an on the, on the ground assessment and say, okay, really where, where to what, you know, what is the extent of this? Because maybe it's important to have some buffering um, to, you know, what is the commercial core? And so they can have standards that apply to, you know, some properties that are, you know, a transition area that's, you know, may or may not be the same as say the BL zone. Um, All right, that was the first question. I think there was one about parking. Parking, yeah, I, I agree. So we say parking strategies here. Um, I think we mentioned it um, one more time. And so we're not asking the consultant to come up with, um, do a parking study, but we would like them right to address you know, if you're, you know, if, for instance, they recommend um, a certain development across the frontage of a lot, you know, then where, where is the parking? Is it, you know, do you try to have access from the side? Do you minimize curb cuts? And, you know, in general, do they recommend, um, you know, say a ratio or, you know, what they would expect? So if they're saying you have to have so much commercial or a certain style, you know, is there parking associated with those uses and just some general general strategy. So we're not asking them to do a, a deep dive into parking. Um, you know, sure, if we had the money, we could do that. Um, I agree then, I, then I think the third one was maybe to mention some of the historic yeah. districts. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, that what? could be added to the second page, the red paragraphs about Amherst. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. We referenced the local historic district bylaw as a reference document, and uh, we would provide maps but I think we can mention those in the narrative as well. All right. All right, Bruce, you've got some comments? Um, a couple, Nate, could you scroll down? I want to uh, go back to where, no, sorry, scrolled up, I meant to say, uh, the, to the top, yes. Uh, I was confused, uh, uh, both what Doug says and what Janet uh, says, uh, the comments for mine as well, um, but take Janet's first, because it's here. Um, it says, uh, as part of a process to define the boundaries of the center. I mean, it, you said, well, they're not really defining the boundaries of the center, they're defining the limit of application of the standards. So I think that this is, uh, I understood exactly as Janet is, I said, well, uh, don't we know where the center, of, where, where the boundaries of the center of town are? And, and you say, that's not the point. Well, I think it, it, this is not clear. This is uh, communicating to me and apparently to Janet as well, that there is uncertainty as to the uh, boundaries of the town center and, and we're asking them to get involved in recommending them. So uh, it's, it, it doesn't, this doesn't say what you said, I don't think. And, and I'll leave it at that. I mean, uh, it's not something I want to go to the wall on. I just, I just echoing that I had the same impression that Janet did. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll down to where uh, Doug was uh, talking about the uh, community values, because again, I had exactly the same. Uh, uh, the town would also like the the, the standards to reflect the community uh, values of blah 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 blah, and I had. The same I said how do you do that and and so one possibility would be to put in front of it wherever possible um, which means that it's not an obligation to, that they have to do it it's an obligation that they should do it where possible uh, because it, it, this this was a little daunting to me I didn't know how you would do that with standards so just a suggestion I don't really need a feel to, to reflect on um, no, no, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, um, you know, the the CRC looked at this, I think, or there's some comments about, you know, could we have, you know, we're looking at trying to be, you know, have um, the net zero buildings or, you know, other things about, you know, it, uh, including, you know, solar. And so, you know, a lot of the standards that I've seen, you know, they they might address it tangentially, but not directly because, right, it may not be possible to actually have this be fully incorporated. So, uh, you know, thanks for the comments. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Okay, we good. So I, I think I wanna go back to the comment that Janet made and that Bruce reiterated about the limits of downtown. And um, are you suggesting that this process might recommend uh, new zoning that would allow downtown 
uh, to expand? Yeah, so this is, you know, this is, it's a, it's a really good point and it's kind of the crux of it all. So when, you know, some towns will have, to me, what is a clear, um, say, business district, and they'll say, let's apply design standards to just this area. For me, you know, and staff, we've talked about it. You know, if we do that, we're just saying, let's look at the BG and BL. But I think there's areas outside those zoning districts that could use design standards because maybe perhaps we want redevelopment there or it will happen. And so, um, you know, if the consultant is saying, you know, let's look across Triangle Street uh, to what's BL, and we think it could have uh, different massing than what the BL allows. I think that's what the consultant is going to recommend. And then it's, you know, it's the town's decision, you know, do we rezone it to allow for that, what the consultant's saying the design standards have? Because if we're only going to limit it to what the BL allows, there's really not a lot to do in this exercise for the consultant. Um, so, yeah, so I'm thinking that if they say, you know, up North Pleasant Street past Kendrick Park, where there's some vacant properties, you know, what was the gateway? And they said, well, why, you know, what if they say this could be redeveloped into three stories and here's some standards that apply there? I think it's then our local decision to say, well, if so, how, what, how, you know, the zoning right now wouldn't allow that, um, you know, for instance, the, uh, so, you know, I, is it redefining the town center or is it really having design standards for certain areas that, you know, I'm not considering that that are design standards, we're going to call all this like a general business design standard. I think that the design standards we could have applied to sub districts, which is mentioned so that, you know, there's, they're actually coming up with, you know, maybe some overarching standards and then they're going to tailor it to these few other these few distinct areas so that you know what's allowed on parts of triangle street may not be the same as what's allowed on parts of north pleasant street okay well i think i mean that sort of touches on one question that i'd had about this this whole introduction which um you know which was kind of what's the attitude toward growth um and um you know, uh, it wasn't until I got to the end of the, the long paragraph on the screen right now in the middle that said it is critical that the downtown design standards allow for development. You know, that was sort of the first place where you were saying, yes, we, we're not just doing design standards within the existing parameters we have right now. We are trying to envision some change. And, um, you know, so I thought that could be stronger, but I, I uh, you know, I saw it here. And so that seemed adequate. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it, we could be mentioned earlier that we're not limiting it to the existing zoning, right? So that it's not, we're not trying to follow the existing zoning dimensional standards or yeah. use, okay. uses. Yeah. Um, Karen. You're muted. Yep, we can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, um, now, now we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So um, how much will a study of this cost, may I ask, just a, a ballpark? So I laugh because when this was first discussed, we said we had up to $100,000 available. And uh, the assumption is that this would might cost more. But um, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a, it is a considerable amount. Yeah. So my question is um, a lot of, I, I really welcome an, a holistic sort of uh, look at the town, but a lot of the things that the consultant is doing are already kind of in the master plan, right? We want a more walkable cars uh, out of town if possible. Um, you know, a vibrant business community. Does it make sense to do a study like this again to uh, get a lot of the details that we've that we've spent many years sort of developing in the master plan? Is is it ever done? And this is probably completely naive. Is it ever done that we just call out uh, town urban developers that have an expertise? You mentioned in references you wanted to look at Ithaca College, and so I was trying to read what, what they had done. Some successful developers to just give us um, 
a, a plan. This is how you get a lot of bicycle paths in here. This is how you you uh, develop transportation from UMass, something like that. Can Did we ever consider going that route or is this a necessary first step, which is gonna be very expensive and uh, they're gonna take a lot of time studying the things that we have and already in all those those different uh, plans that we have that you listed, 13 or 14 of them, they're gonna take a long time to study that and come up to speed. And yes, they're experts, but what about just calling for plans from urban developers that say, look, this is how we can really enliven your town. Is that ever been tossed around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I, right. So I, I agree that in general principle, those are things that are agreed upon and stated. I think uh, what isn't is the detail and the kind of the necessary framework to really make some, you know, have buildings or the built environment look like we, you know, you know, like something we want. So here's the city of College Place is one that if this is visible, I share, change my sharing that, you know, what what's done here is, okay, you know, just some, you know, first page, but they're already indicating what they would like. And so what um, was nice about this standard was, um, you know, it's both graphic it ha and what I like about it is for each area, they have an intent of what they're looking for. They have criteria and then they have, you know, um, specific to that place, you know, images. And so, you know, the master plan talks about, yes, vibrancy and walkable, but it doesn't really say, like, what does that mean? Is that an eight foot sidewalk or is that a 12 foot sidewalk? Is that a four story building or is that, you know, how much glazing on the first floor? You know, is it street trees? And so, you know, I think we, you know, I think everyone has a different opinion of what's appropriate and what that looks like. And so, and it's not really codified or, you know, in a, in a, in a way that it can be applied consistently right now. And so, that's what you know we're hoping with these standards so you know here you know i did i you know for this you know this is um it was done for a specific place it's actually applied at the county level so it's you know this is in washington state so it's a county commission that does the permitting here but i just you know i think these you know every um you know the intent and everything is very clear and then they use these illustrations with um you know with annotations and some you know some uh dimensions to show what they really like and so you know, I would like to think that the consultant would come to Amherst, look at those plans. And we do say that the emphasis is on the, the design standards and not, you know, a, you know, an exhaustive analysis of existing conditions and documents, because we do have a lot, but take what we have and say, okay, um, here's how we can come up with design standards that um, respond to what Amherst is asking and what's, what's built. And so, um, you know, I, I think, so for me, I think something like this is really informative. Um, you know, I can jump to Ithaca. They did something similar too. You know, it's it's they're much bigger. This is a college town. Um, you know, but they they had the same kind of the same uh, kind of philosophy, where they have you know the, this is their design guidelines. So they have you know an introduction, their guiding principles, and then site design for a specific things. So surface parking, driveway access, service areas, and you know, right now we don't have that kind of level of detail. Uh, in the zoning bylaw. And so I, I'd like to think that the design standards would have a similar format that when, you know, for instance, if there's a new project proposed, uh, you know, where the spoke is, for instance, we would have some of this to say, here's, you know, here are the ingredients. This is what we're looking for. You know, if you'd like a four-story building, here's the type of window pattern, maybe material. Here's how it relates to the curb in the street in terms of pedestrian, you know, experience. Um, you know, if we want awnings or so anyways, I, I agree that I think there's a lot already done. Um, it just hasn't really been to me synthesized and then, uh, you know, done to this level. And I, and Nate, I could add on as for Karen's benefit as a member of the planning board, when we, uh, approved the last archipelago building, that's, uh, I guess it's 11 East Pleasant that's going up now. Um, you know, we have our zoning that gives us height and setbacks, but we don't have a lot about the articulation of the building. And um, so I think it's my, my understanding that, you know, some people like the buildings that Archipelago is putting up and some people don't. 
and there's differing opinions about the street level of those buildings and how transparent they are and whether they are in conducive to commercial uh, occupants or, or tenants or not. You know, we know they've had a hard time renting all of the first floor of one East Pleasant. And I think some of us think that some of the columns that come all the way down on that building are really not encouraging commercial occupancy. So there's details like that that I think I was hoping would come out of this process. Um, yeah, on the other hand, uh, what's to say uh, we're having a competition for this part and everybody submit your plans and then we see in those five plans what seem well i, I think i is, think the thing that is that to have a competition for a design for property that the town doesn't own there's no incentive for a developer to propose something for land they don't control or that we don't control Okay, that's the hitch. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah, thank you. So, this is our way of suggesting to both the landowner and the developers here's what we're happy, here's how we'd like it to go. I got it. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, my hope is that they do look beyond just North Pleasant Street and into, you know, the adjacent properties and you know, I'm calling them kind of sub districts of design standards. And I'd like to think that we could extrapolate that and say, okay, well, could we apply these in East Amherst or in other areas as well? And so, you know, parts of the design standards could then apply other places, um, you know, and we, you know, hopefully we'd have enough information that we could make that work. And so, you know, we're really, we're focusing on the, the, the town center for now, but, you know, you know, if it's, I'm hoping it's done in a way that we could say, okay, can we take pieces of this and then have it apply in other areas as well? Well, Nate, you could structure it as not site specific, but different types of environment. You know, like here's the most highly urban type of environment Amherst would want. And here's the second most, and here's a village center. And then it's not site specific and you just right. apply it wherever we want to apply it. Uh, Janet. Um, I'm actually very enthusiastic about doing a downtown design process with the community. I think it would um, bring people together um, for us to sort of say, I mean, I Doug, remember you saying this way back when you started on the board, you know, is there agreement on heights? Is there agreement on setbacks? Is there agreement on look? And I think my hope is in this process with flexibility, we will come to an agreement and, and be part of a community process of putting together something. Um, I think that the way this is worded in terms of the language that about expanding the downtown is opening up a can of worms. And so I think the goal is to build support, not dissension. And I think if people thought, oh, this is the gateway coming back, or my neighborhood is now going to become part of a commercial district, people are just going to lean in and against it. And I don't, I don't think we want to do that. I think, you know, there's a lot of room to build up now in downtown. Um, we have a lot of single story buildings. And I think the question is, is if we can put in design standards that show that the buildings we have figured out what we want to see as a community, the buildings come in, you're building support for increased density that people like. And I, I do think that, you know, next when we look at hopefully East Amherst Village Center, we probably don't want the same heights as downtown, but people will know what the look is. They would, they'll feel comfortable with it. Maybe in 10 or 15 years, they'll want to expand the downtown, but I wouldn't put that onto the consultant because I think you're going to, they're going to run into a wall. And that's really a decision for the town council to make for us to recommend. I would just take that off the table and just focus on our downtown. I don't, you know, you know, the BL, the BG, I don't know if we're going to go down to the Emily, you know, down to the, um, what is it, business neighborhood, um, you know, by Bruno's or not. But I just, I do, I don't, th I think if this language persists, people are going to be very suspicious in the start. I don't think we want to create with that tone. Um, 
if this process works and we have good designs, we have a stronger community and we'll be happier and we'll have development that's bigger, you know, and, you know, just helping our town in every way. I just, I just think this language is too open to construction. And when you're talking about the gateway or going more into the neighborhoods, I think people are going to be really immediately opposed. Right, know? but I, yeah, I don't, but I don't, I don't see this as just a commercial downtown design standard. I think it's, you know, if the properties along Kellogg Ave, you know, um, you know, on the north side going back, you know, the first stretch, they could be torn down and rebuilt at some point. And so, you know, we don't have anything guiding that. And that's, you know, adjacent to the downtown. It's in a residential zone, but I think it'd be nice to have design standards apply there. And so I, I to me, that's part of the town center. To me, the town center isn't, you know, just one property off of North Pleasant Street. It's a much bigger area. And so, you know, I'm, you know, Doug kind of said in terms of, you know, there's like archetypes of like where we want um, the design centers to apply different, you know, environments. And so I'm not envisioning this as just, you know, the main corridor, but also what's happening, you know, a few properties back, you know, what does that look like in terms of height and facing the street and design standards? So, well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that some residents may be concerned. We're not saying that we're going to be promoting, you know, commercial development in a residential neighborhood. But what I'm saying is we can have design standards if there's going to be um, big changes. We have some ability here to say what we want it to look like. All right. Uh, I guess if we can move on. Uh, it's the 10 of nine. So let's let's see. You want to say anything about this third page? The scope of services, Doug? Yeah, I mean, I, I really didn't have any comments on this page. Did others? Uh, Janet? I'm not sure if it goes into the task one or task two, but I thought that it'd be good for the consultants to meet early on with um, kind of um, the planning board, the ZBA, the historic commission, the design review board, disability access. Um, I just thought that that should happen earlier in the process because we're all dealing all the time with this area and um, get feedback from the public a lot. So I thought it'd be good to put us in earlier in the process. Okay, Janet, I actually completely agree with that. And I had that comment when I saw the presentations to those boards and committees under task four, uh, kind of what, you know, did we have any involvement earlier? Uh, and I, I guess the way you've structured it, our basic opportunity is to participate in the public process as private citizens. And that may be fine, uh, but uh, I think some of us, you know, would be happy to have more uh, involvement as a board. Well, I think it would help the consultants to hear our experience, you know, working with this. Okay. Uh, Bruce. You are muted. My apologies. There you go. Uh, task two, uh, we scrolled up and down and through it, but uh, so scroll down a little, uh, Nate, if you would. Uh, stop. Um, I noted uh, here where it says conduct stakeholder meetings, uh, interviews, it's focus groups, there should be five to seven stakeholders. So, um, what I did was uh, when I was looking at this, I, I noted that, uh, that, that various tasks say public forums, neighborhood workshops, uh, um, at least three, uh, attend uh, public events, at least three, hold public meetings, at least three, hold presentations, at least six, um, and I wondered why there was no at least uh, a number of uh, stakeholders meeting suggested. Is there a reason why we wouldn't do what we've done for all of the other um, stated uh, um, events like these, that you would want to put a number of stakeholders meetings? Uh, is, 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 was that just omitted or was it omitted intentionally? I mean, the number of, the, the, the minimum number of. Yeah, it was totally intentional. 
Um, no, I, yeah, good point. I was thinking that it would be, you know, we list a fair number of what we, who we'd want as stakeholders. And so, um, yeah, no, maybe it would be good. I mean, it, it was only intentional in the thought that it would be something we could talk about with the consultant to say, okay, let's have eight. But maybe if we think we're going to have a lot of focus groups, we should just say that so that they, you know, are, are understand what our expectation is. So, um, you know, I wasn't trying to limit the number of focus groups. I was just thinking it was something that would be, you know, discussed and negotiated, but perhaps we won't want to put, like you said, a minimum or, you know, or some, some approximate number just so it's clear. It helps the scope. I mean, this is really a, the scope of work and, and, and all of the other, uh, attend three public events to present information and receive comment. Um, uh, you, you, you've been specific and so the uh, consultant can, can add up the number of events that they either have to attend or that they have to uh, host themselves, initiate themselves, and that'll give them some idea. Uh, and I just thought that probably what will happen is uh, the consultants uh, in making their proposal would ask or they would state in their proposal, and maybe that's what you would want. But it, it just seemed that it was just different in, in uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the stakeholders' uh, meetings were treated differently in the proposal, that's all. I mean, Nate, you did ask for a pretty detailed sort of schedule of work and an outline of how they would do the process. So, I mean, you could just leave it to them to propose a certain number um, and then use that as part of the differentiation between teams. But yep. I mean, Bruce is right here. You know, you have been a little bit inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you can take your hand down and, and Janet, you're next. Um, in terms of stakeholder meetings, I think 60 or 70% of our population are UMass students or students. And I, I thought, you know, obviously, you, it's hard, it'd be hard to meet with them all. But I think I thought that they should be pulled out as a separate group because they're probably a huge user of downtown, maybe Amherst College students. But I, I feel like that's the majority of who lives in Amherst. And they should be sort of there should be outreach to the campuses and things like that. I'm not sure if stakeholder meetings, but I think that could be one thing. Um, but we have a lot of students in town and, you know, we want them to come downtown in a peaceful and um, shopping manner. But they, you know, what do they want to see downtown? Well, be careful what you ask for, Janet. You know, they're going to want lots of housing and uh, plenty of bars or something. Well, maybe not, maybe not, but I think they should be, um, they already have, you know, so. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. They might want cheaper housing than, you know, $1,500 a bed, you know. Right. You know. All right. Um, any so other there is comments? A, public, a public hand, an attendee. I'm sorry? Uh, an attendee has their hand up. I'm... Oh, okay. Well, I was I I did see Dorothy's hand, um, yeah. and I thought we would go through the board members' comments and then mm -hmm. uh, turn to the public. Sure. Should I keep scrolling down? Is that? Yeah, I think so. And so, yeah. Um, just to Bruce's point and what we've said, you know, we're. In, in, in the scope of services, we, you know, we've added some language, sorry for the scrolling up here. Um, you know, some of it is we can have some contract negotiations. And so, you know, we're asking the consultant to uh, meet this scope of work, but, uh, and explain it with, you know, um, their methodology and, and their proposal, uh, but also perhaps, you know, depending on cost, where can the town staff help things? So, you know, Doug, you know, you said, wow, this scope could be more than what we have budgeted. And for instance, if the consultant would like to do a visual preference survey, you know, they could, um, you know, they could um, essentially maybe get the images and, and structure it they, they want to, but then staff could perhaps administer it, right? We could, we could um, solicit it, we could get the, the comments, the feedback, and then, you know, get, compile the data and get it to the consultant. So they're not spending their time doing that. And so, you know, uh, 
I like the idea of getting uh, boards and committees um, engaged earlier and maybe you know that becomes in task two. At the same time, I'm not sure I want the consultant to go to eight different boards and committees at the beginning. So maybe it's a consolidated thing, but you know, I, I think mentioning it is important. So, you know, again, if you know, maybe they have experience that they would write into their proposal about how to achieve all this, right? How they can structure their own engagement processes. And we're asking them to do that, to come up with an engagement plan. So uh, hopefully we say we say it and then they can, you know, if they have some other ideas, they can, they can, they can present that. All right, so task three, task four, um, uh, and then here's task five. Uh, so there were some uh, changes. Nate, hold on, Janet. Yes. Sorry. Um, I, I, you may have already, this might be something the town is planning on anyway, but I thought about like a, an interactive website where you could have examples or surveys or comments or discussion or, you know, like consolidating feedback. Like, I don't know that the, the consultant would administer it, but they may have experience with that kind of thing, like how to um, involve the public and inform the public. So I, I don't know where that would go, but it seemed like that would be really important, especially with the students and um, people who aren't able to get to meetings. Right. So we have Engage Amherst, and we also have you know the the um, Civic Plus, the the traditional Amherst. So I think there's ways to do that. Um, I agree. I'm I'm hoping that as part of their proposal, you know, we're asking them to come up with a community engagement plan and a strategy. And so if they're saying you know there's a web presence, there can be online surveys, there can be other ways to do it. You know, we you know. Uh, planning staff, we can meet with IT and the community outreach officers and come up with, you know, what the town can do. Um, you know, sometimes consultants say, oh, I have a subscription to these services and I can put it on this other platform. You know, they might belong to, um, you know, a community forum website that they can easily adapt for, for the project, or if not, we can do it. So, yeah, I'm hoping that they, you know, that's part of the comparative right review. You know, what are they going to bring in terms of that kind of those strategies? All right. Why don't you scroll on down? I don't see any hands yet. Uh, when you get to section six, I had a comment. Sure. So, so you have a lot about the team, but you never define it. And, um, you know, at least my experience with offices of this sort is you have a couple of people who are highly experienced, many years of, in, the, in the field. And then you, as you move down the hierarchy, people are younger and less experienced. And, um, you know, I think, I think what, it seemed to me that what you really want to know is who are the representatives of the firm that are going to be the face of this uh process you know who is it that's always going to be the moderator of the meetings and um you know are, do they come across as experienced and credible and i think you also had something maybe in the comparative analysis about you know encouraging some diversity of gender and 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 race or whatever cultural backgrounds uh in that so you know, I, I, I think as a respondent, you, you, you want to try to adjust your definition of the team to meet your requirements, right? So, you know, if I have 20 years of experience, but I'm going to have four people who are younger and are going to do my computer renderings and the grunt work, and they only have five years of experience, maybe I don't meet the seven years minimum. And so, I just think you need to be, you know, you're you're sort of opening yourself up to people gaming the way they define the word team uh, at the moment, and maybe that's fine, um, you know. But when you know when you look at a team, it's it's the people in the office. Sometimes there's sub consultants, and it could be a pretty big group that's actually the team, and you probably don't want all of them to show up at the evening meetings. Um, so, you know, that, that can affect your fee in addition. So I think you need, I, I felt like you should be a little more strategic about what does team mean, or maybe it's 
who are the representatives who are, you know, who are the face of the of the firm? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, there's also some comments, you know, there's been some comments made that, you know, we also don't want to discourage young and, you know, kind of maybe innovative uh, professionals who may not have the experience. So I think I agree that, um, you know, we could define team. We've had this discussion and other uh, procurement, um, you know, procurements. And so we're, we're, you know, we're asking the consultant to provide kind of what, how they define it themselves, right? So we're saying it could be anywhere from engineers to architects to landscape architects to, you know, um, you know, um, sustainability consultants. So uh, I'm not okay. sure right. right now, I, I, I'm, you know, I think it's a good point. I think um, staff can talk about it. I'm, you know, again, I'm hoping as part of the review criteria, they're submitting, you know, and number four here, we have the project manager. So we're hoping that they give us an outline of what the team is. Is it five members? Is it seven members? What is the experience and resume of all those members on the team? And then because it's not a, you know, this is both kind of a qualitative and kind of a quantitative review. It's not just that, oh, they have this, you know, um, you know, two people who have 30 years experience and then they're doing all the work and then they have the, you know, one or two people that are doing this. We like to see the breadth of the entire team and how they collaborate together. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that that's what they, that we're expecting that that's what they're going to present in their proposal, describe okay. how the team works. Yeah. All right. So my only other comment in this area, and it wasn't exact, I mean, it doesn't have to be addressed in this area was, um, you know, we now do a lot of meetings remotely over computer. And so, you know, when on item four here, where you talk about public meetings and evening meetings, you know, I don't know whether you want to leave it up. I mean, there's going to, you'll need to have some level of conversation about how many meetings do you expect them to come here for and be in person versus doing over the Zoom platform. And um, so, you know, whether you want to direct them at this point into in some some direction about that or just leave it to the way they how they want to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that you haven't mentioned here uh, that, you know, you you realize there will be a couple of different. Delivery, you know, ways of meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. OK. All right. Um, anything else on this page, board members? All right, moving along. Okay, so when you got to comparative review on page nine, um, so you have all these criteria for comparative review, but there's never any mention of fee. And are you going to be judging these? at all on the basis of fee, or are you gonna have them put their fee in a separate envelope and you don't open it until you've selected who you wanna work with? Right, so this is a, we don't see the fee at all. So we don't know what any any of the consultants fees are. So your your latter comments, correct. So this is, you know, gonna be a, a, you know, a quality based review based on their proposal and responses. And uh, we only take, you know, we'll only see the fee of the selected proposal. So um, it's not okay. at all fee-based. If we're gonna go that route, really, we would not have comparative review and we take the lowest qualified bidder, the lowest price of the qualified bidder. So, um, you know, that's something we're saying we don't necessarily want because, uh, you know, we'd like to be able to have interviews and review proposals and see, you know, what team, you know, has, you know, the best fit for Amherst and has, you know, uh, you know, really it's a comparative review amongst all proposals submitted. So, um, you know, it's really how, you know, what's the best proposal, you know, uh, compared to the rest that we've received. All right, uh, Bruce, you're, you're muted. My my spacebar depression doesn't seem to work anymore. That was usually my go-to for short mute, uh, unmute. Uh, simply on this page, the second uh, line, uh, second sentence, projects meeting the minimum requirements. Uh, do you not mean proposals meeting the minimum requirements? Right. Uh, 
and then I'll have another word, but that's on page 11. Mm -hmm. I guess my only com I had one other sort of comment on, on um, I guess it was topic number one, the comparable projects. Um, I guess I, I, it seems like the pandemic has kind of put a, was a real interruption on a lot of sort of design processes. And I guess I just wondered whether it was going to be feasible for anybody to have, you know, um, as many projects within the last seven years as you were suggesting, and and whether you know anything happened in college towns in the last three years. Uh, so you may end up with several, you know, a majority of the proposals not being most advantageous you know, maybe only a few that are advantageous. And I just wondered whether that's gonna discourage people from uh, even proposing, you know, if they, if they say, well, you know, I'm gonna, I've done projects, you know, I've done three projects in the last seven years and I'm gonna be not advantageous, why would I do this? So I was just wondering whether it would make sense to reduce your threshold at all. But yeah, I think Chris raised your hand. Say, I think Chris would agree that this could be um, reduced or changed. And so, yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I, you know, um, you know, when we're right. So, like I, I said, I was trying to create the those three categories to have some clear distinction. And so, if we want to, you know, change one, we can change change them all, perhaps. And I, I'm okay with that. I agree that you know. Uh, maybe this is too uh, too aggressive. I mean, if we're thinking that the project we have in hand could take eighteen to twenty four months, and then we're asking that they've you know done four of these in seven years, it's an accelerated schedule than what we're even asking. So, well, it it also caused me to wonder whether your target audience is firms in Massachusetts, or are you open to having firms who are coming from a farther distance? Because obviously, if you let the firms from outside of the state participate, um, you know, you're more likely to get people with more experience, but then you're going to be paying for travel costs. And, you know, I think within Massachusetts, I don't know how many firms could do this. That's a good point. I think, yeah, the way this will be advertised, it'll be, you know, advertised locally, but it'll also be advertised, um, you know, at the state level. So. Uh, you know, in the central register and goes in bulletins. So I think firms regionally will see this. So, you know, anyone who subscribes, you know, any company who's looking to do public work usually subscribes to some of the services that this will be posted in. So it's not necessarily that we're targeting firms from, you know, Virginia, but it could be that they see it and maybe they often collaborate with someone out of Boston and they say, hey, let's put a proposal together. Um, Okay. You know, but yeah, so I, I, I you know, I, I, to your point though, I think, you know, Chris, we've talked about this internally that maybe we have to change some of these, these measurements because it is, like I said, a little um, strict, but back to who were, who's, you know, who, you know, so one thing I was going to say tonight is we can reach out to certain firms and say, here's, look what we're doing, but we're also, this is going to go through a pretty public advertisement process and, you know, it's, it, it'll get out there. And so I was going to say, when we did the comprehensive housing market study in the 2000 teens, you know, I was surprised to see we had companies, you know, we had someone from California or, you know, like places that had never been to Amherst that somehow saw our request for proposal and they were responding, um, you know, and it's, so when this is advertised, that's what we will get. Um, okay, great. Uh, I great. wonder, you know, maybe to help the the two year pandemic or two and a half year thing, just make it a longer period, like nine years, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. And Chris, you have your hand up. I guess I just wondered, do we have to say what the duration of time is? Can we just say three similar projects? Do we have to say within a certain period of time? Is that required, Nate? No. So, you know, I think that people would necessarily want to show, you know, their best work, which is probably their recent work if they've been building up experience. So I'm I'm thinking that maybe we don't need to have that time period um, so prominent. 
maybe we could stretch it out. Maybe we could say, like Janet said, nine years or 12 years or something, something large so that we're not constraining people. Because I think a lot of these firms aren't only going to be doing urban design and urban planning. They're also going to be building buildings and they're going to be designing parks and they're going to be doing a lot of other things. So, you know, if they had three or four similar projects, it would be kind of amazing that they would have that many similar projects to this in a short amount of time. So I'm all for either elongating the time or not having it. All right. Um, so anybody else have comments on this page? Um, I, I have no more comments on the document. Uh, Bruce. Um, well, uh, I've got a couple of comments. Uh, if we go down to page 11, there's a word, uh, I guess, uh, um, where are we? Uh, I'm just going to have to swipe over to... Uh, um whoops sorry ah here we go yes okay come back um uh, oh there we go uh right at the bottom there um uh provide a dynamic presentation i guess i'm just allergic uh to the use of the word dynamic uh and, and uh, I would vastly prefer if I were reading this and trying to imagine that responding it, that I would be challenged to provide a cogent presentation rather than a dynamic one. And I don't know whether that's your preference as well, Nate, but dynamic just seems to be one of those words that people use when they can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> I couldn't, so that's so great for the, for the suggestion. No, I, <laughs> yeah, again, um, uh, you know, it was interesting when we asked for um, presentations, that means everyone who's submitting a proposal has to be given the opportunity to give a presentation. And so it's not like we can say, we're going to do the first round and then the second round is going to have a presentation. That means if we get 15 proposals, all 15 proposals will include a presentation. And then the difficulty is, what's the comparative re review criteria? So how do we extinguish between an advantageous and a, most, you know, a more advantageous um, yeah. presentation? And so if you know if you think the you know right a dynamic presentation is really not um explaining that very well then we can change that and so i've, I've heard some really awful dynamic presentations mm -hmm. that right. really made my skin crawl and made me want to uh, run out to the room or get rid of them as quickly as possible and get on to the next uh, uh, contender uh, yeah. so dynamic doesn't do it for me but cogent does but, uh, but about, there are other, uh, it's probably other words that, that com go compelling to. or engaging. Engaging is good. Mm -hmm. I, I actually felt the same way. I just thought it seemed like I would go for a very calm, thorough, you know, showing a mastery of the project, the process, a history of past success. I don't, I don't need to be thrilled. And mm -hmm. I, I thought in a way it was like, <laughs> you know, I just thought I, I, a laid back person or a introvert who could deliver the goods you know is fine with me <laughs> well right so then yeah so i guess then it's um agreed it doesn't so you know then um you know what's the what is the distinction between the categories then right is it is it the amount of information the mastery so we're trying to also show right i think we could eliminate this and um you know and then have that it's really you know, how, how is the information presented? How informative is it? What kind of mastery do they show? And so really that's the uh, the comparative piece, not... I mean, you could just take the word out and it still right. reads as a sentence. Right. Yeah. You know, an understanding of, of the project because that's you know, how much time they attention they pay to what we're asking to do is, is gonna be really helpful to evaluate them, I think. Right, yeah. like if they call Amherst a city all the time. <laughs> But, but we are, Nate. 
Can I just have say a... one thing that um, the the second and third um, indicate that there's a, an understanding, but the first one doesn't. So maybe you need to add that to the first one. An understanding yeah. of the project. Pretty right? definitely, I would say. Oh, is that missing? Okay, yeah. usually it's um. All right. Yep. Yeah. Maybe a deep understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or thorough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can do that in your own time, I guess. Yeah, I'm just uh, gonna put well, that right here for now. But all right. Okay. Uh, uh, and apropos of that, uh, when I read it, it it uh, it wasn't clear this this whole business of. Uh, interviewing and and face to face and that and and uh, i thought it's not clear to me that there is um and maybe this is because this is a different way of doing business than i'm used to but but i'm used to when you're receiving proposals from people uh from organized from groups and there may be many and you shortlist a few and you interview them um and you have this face-to-face -face engagement and it's not just a presentation but there's a, a, a question and answer and so forth where through a process by which you can get a feel for the chemistry uh the human chemistry um of the people that you are contemplating working with for a year or two um and so uh, first of all, uh, it, it didn't seem to, it, it, it wasn't clear that you were shortlisting, and maybe you're not. It wasn't clear that they were face to face, and it wasn't clear that there was a, a to and fro, uh, a question and answer um, um, process. So yeah, we can't, we can't shortlist. So everyone has to be reviewed using the same criteria so we can't you know narrow it down from seven to three and then have a different review process for those three it's really you know the review process is for everyone um and we make a decision uh in the in the standard boilerplate um we do allow for a question and answer but not material uh questions and answers so it's really if there's something that kind of like we did tonight if there's a misunderstanding or we need clarification, but we wouldn't be able to ask, um, you know, one consultant to provide different information uh, that we're not asking another, you know, proposal. So it's, you know, really kind of, we have to follow this, this standard process. And, you know, I think some of it could be in the past, uh, you know, regulations can be updated or, you know, reinterpreted. And so, yeah, I think, you know, 15 years ago, if the town were doing this, we may have followed a different process, uh, and but okay. you know, since then we've had different guidance or things have been up. I, I know in 2016 and 18, the state's procurement regulations were updated, and so mm. I think they've taken out some of that. Um, I don't know if we, want to, we call it ambiguity, but you know that ability to shortlist and then have different criteria for say the three as opposed to the the all of that mm. submitted proposal. So I feel like they've you know may have changed some of that that than what was done in the past. So I guess this is just a different process. For example, with the school, the town, so this is, I guess, uh, um, uh, a submission, a statement of qualifications or something of like that. And it's a, in a form that allows you then to say, this is the uh, set of qualifications or that, that I prefer, and you choose um, those, because it seems possible that if you've got you know, a dozen or fifteen respondents, and you're obligated to treat to 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 interview everybody. That's a really onerous. So I guess you must imagine that you're not going to get uh, just a a, a large uh, number of respondents here, and that you're comfortable or you, you don't feel threatened by the uh, workload associated with uh, winnowing down um, the respondents. Yeah, no, I, I think it will actually be, um, you know, a task for the committee. So on that point, you know, I'm, I'm considering like a, probably a five person review committee. Uh, you know, the town manager has to first, uh, you know, approve of this and say that it's necessary, which, you know, he's, he's been briefed on it. And then 
the town manager appoints a review committee. Uh, the review committee would review proposals independently and then together as a group. And then, you know, also with the um, proposal, you know, the presentations. And so, I mean, it could be that we, you know, that we receive, you know, eight to 12 proposals and it is a time commitment. Um, and so, I, yeah, you know, I, you know, I guess we just have to set aside that time. Um, yeah. Okay, so it, it, it's helpful. This is this is this is not the way. This is an unfamiliar way of doing business, but it, that's fi I, fine. I don't. Uh, I just need to know that mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what I'm what I've been reviewing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I want to just mention it's 25 after nine. So um, I was hoping this wasn't going to be a really late meeting. Um, so I think we're close to the end of the document. Um, unless board members have another oh, more uh, more additional pressing comments, I'd like to go to the public and and let the comment that uh, the woman that's got her hand raised and has had it for quite some time make her comment. So uh, Pam, could we bring Dorothy Pam in and let her make uh, her comment? Okay, can. Nate, can you stop and sharing Pam, your screen? Pam, sure, yeah. thank you for your patience. Here we go. Hello, Dorothy, if you'd give Hi. us your name and your address. How are you? How are you? Very uh, well. I have a, a number of comments to make, but uh, the first one that just occurred to me this exact last moment, there was something way back there about um, diversity or whatever. And I thought, okay, there was some attempt, I believe at social justice to be as a consideration in here. And I thought of certainly a way there could be some, and that could be that if they're going to be apartment buildings, that there be um, a larger number of affordable units uh, that could be at a variety of, of affordable levels. But that, that, if, that if there's going to be apartment, that it not just be these high, very expensive uh, student rentals. Um, so that may have been what was behind the mind of whoever wrote that word in. Um, so our first question is, um, were you planning to change the overlay downtown, overlay district downtown, which says there, there's no parking because people don't need cars because we have a bus, because we now know that the demand for parking is in fact there and it's not going away. Um, because I think that's a very important issue and it's not mentioned or addressed except in um, considering parking. Um, secondly, uh, it, I'm, not, I'm a little concerned you might be removing the buffer between the uh, dense commercial district and the established residential district, which um, I would not like. Um, and um, again, I hope that you're not gonna allow high rises on both sides of Kendrick Park. Um, I happen to be very fond of the buildings that are there or buildings of that style, but we, I do not want to see the park shaded with high rises on both sides, which was something we mentioned a while back. Um, I think that you need to give the architectural firms some guidance on what you have in mind, because uh, do you want them to kind of follow UMass's uh, brutalist style of architecture or to take a look at our historic downtown in the block of North uh, Pleasant Street, you know, near Town Hall, um, or some of the other uh, historical residential areas in town. Um, otherwise, you could get a lot of really crazy designs that would cause a lot of people to have um, heart attacks. But I also am very concerned about the outreach groups, which are limited to five or seven, and the whole list of categories is there. And of course, that would mean that somebody from a residential neighborhood would be one of them um, and would be. You know, so by by deliberately limiting these groups to five to seven, that may be the uh, consequence in, intended or unintended, um, which would discourage people from participating as they would say, well, what's the point? Um, so the other question, the last question is, is this money already set aside? I think I thought there was some sense that this money was actually in a pot somewhere. Because um, if not, um, given some of the, the harsh realities we're just discovering in terms of our capital projects, um, I, I, I have questions about the financing of it. So those are my comments and questions. Thank you very much for letting me offer these. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. 
Nate, do you want to comment on any of those? I thought, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, go ahead. Yeah, I think the, the funding is in place. So it was a capital request or a, you know, a, a request of the planning department um, the other year. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's good. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, back to like what, you know, the focus groups, I think we would have a minimum. I mean, I, you know, we're hoping that the consultant does everything from, you know, these focus groups that could be anywhere from, you know, 70 to 90 people to other outreach efforts. And so, you know, and it may be that there, a lot of time and money can be spent on outreach. And so, uh, you know, if the consultant thinks there's other ways to engage the town, whether like Janice said, through its online um, surveys, or if they think the town could do it, uh, staff could do it. So we're not spending mm -hmm. consultant money on outreach. I think you know, that can be part of the process. Okay. So okay. we're not yeah. trying to limit who's who's involved. It's just, you know, that's a kind of a time consumptive effort. And, you know, I think the consultant, um, you know, can do that. And I think we can try to help help augment what their service is, but we'd love to have, have their expertise in the design piece. Um, yeah. And then, you know, really what's appropriate for architecture. So I think uh, you know, when, when, when we staff meet, meets with them and if they meet with the boards and committees uh, earlier in the process, I think we'll hear that there's, um, you know, kind of different opinions on what's appropriate downtown, what's good architecture, what's bad architecture. And so, you know, I'd like to have the, you know, these experts say what is appropriate. So is it a blending of style? Is it okay that we have modern looking buildings, but it's appropriate because the proportions, the rhythm, the patterns, the setback, the height all make sense. And so, you know, we're not, I'm not, I have my ideas and, you know, everyone has theirs. So I, I'm, I'm relying on the consultant to do that. Um, and I do think, Janet, you said at one point, I just want to say like the height of buildings and what are we doing here? And, you know, back to the parking district. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, right now we define height in our bylaw a certain way in that you know, it doesn't include the parapet. It doesn't include HVAC or equipment on the roof. And I'd like the consultant to say, this is what I think is appropriate because, you know, essentially people can add height to their building and massing by putting things on, on the roof that's not calculated into height. And so, you know, that's something I'd want the consultant to look at. Um, in terms of the municipal parking district, yeah, we're not asking them to specifically address um, the district, but if they say, given the development patterns of Amherst and here's some parking strategies and they think that parking could be provided or should be, then, you know, then it's, then it's our local decision to say, okay, maybe the municipal parking district has run its course and now it's time to change it. You know, it was, it was, you know, it was offered as a kind of an incentive to help development downtown. We, we have development downtown. And so is it time to, you know, look at that again? And so, you know, I'm hoping the consultant touches on that a little bit. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. And thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Pam Rooney has her hand up. Uh, why don't we bring her over? You could give us your name and your address. This is the plethora of Pams tonight. Thank you for letting me in. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to Bruce for asking for the names to be read at the beginning of the meeting. I think that, you know, we've been asking for that for quite a while and that's very nice. Um, specific comments, uh, a couple people have already touched on the fact that the, having a meeting with the P, uh, planning board, ZBA, DAC, DRB earlier in the process, maybe they get treated like a stakeholder group so that they, I mean, cause you are the people that are being asked to interpret today's zoning bylaws, <clears throat> how, do these, how do these guidelines inform your process and how do they help you? And I think that, I think that would be really helpful to, to get that. I had the same question about why do you limit the stakeholder group size to five to seven? You know, I think for, uh, boy, I can't remember what the process, was. oh, it was the 40R process where the stakeholders were all of the business or the building owners, property owners in downtown and some business owners, no neighbors, um, that appeared to be the stakeholder group. Um, I think each of these categories, you definitely might have more than five to seven people. I don't think that would add cost to having a stakeholder meeting by having a slightly larger group. Um, thinking about some of the selection uh, 
characterizations like the presentation of the proposal. When I look at advantage, advantageous, the presentation development team provide an understanding of the project. The presentation is clear and informative and all team members participate. That's what I want to see. <laughs> so that's, that's quite advantageous to me. If you wanted to make it most advantageous, perhaps you include something about a deep understanding of the project uh, and a well-described uh, engagement process or something, you know, the public, in, uh, the public involvement process that appears to be reasonable and, and uh, all-encompassing or something to that nature. Um, and that's it for now, but thank you. Thank you, Pam. Oh, yeah, thanks. I, and I, sorry, I just want to say, yeah, maybe I misunderstood Dorothy's question. So yeah, I, I, I just changed that, right? I, I think we could have more stakeholders in each focus group. Um, so I, I, I apologize to Dorothy if I misunderstood that. So I, I, I agree. Um, so we could have, you know, have more, more people in each focus group. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I think we can, uh, we can do that. Um, maybe you have five to seven stakeholder meetings. Right, um, right, right. That would be the quantity that you were looking for earlier. The last thing I wanted to say before I forget is that I am completely delighted that you are at this point where you're getting ready to do an RFP for this very, very important project. All Thank right. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Pam. Come on up. All right. Um, Nate, we've gotten our comments. And uh, Chris, do you know if any of the other board members who were not present this evening have sent any in? Uh, you are muted. Muted? No, I don't believe they have. We can reach out to them again if you think. Yeah, if you don't mind doing that, just to remind them that this is their chance to weigh in. So thank you, Nate, for the presentation and all your work. All right, if, unless there's anything else anybody wants to say about this topic, um, I guess we will consider this closed for this evening. Uh, the time is 9.36, and uh, I guess we can go on to the, the parts of the agenda on page two. Uh, Chris, starting with old business, anything not anticipated 48 hours in advance? No old business. All right, what about new business? No new business. All right, I think I saw in my packet some form A and R drawings. So, there, there is Pam, a do you want to bring those up? Pam's done a good job of exploring this. It's is rather that, complicated. Do you want to talk about it, Pam, or do you want me I, to talk about I it? I think you should just go ahead and talk about it, but I've got lots of slides here to back you up and support you. Okay, so this um, property is located on Pelham Road. Um, it's east of the Fort River, east of the bridge, and it's almost to Poets Corner. And it's one of these long, narrow lots that was created a long time ago. Um, I think the front house was built in 1900 and the back house was built in 1950. Um, and it's owned by um, a group of siblings, and they would like to be able to um, sell the property and get some um, remuneration from it, from these. And one of the siblings wants to live in the front house. So um, what they're proposing to do <clears throat> is they're proposing to connect the area shown in yellow to the blue area. So they wanna make one big lot and then they wanna subdivide that lot. And Pam, if you can show us the, yeah, that's great. So the green lines are showing um, the property line between the yellow property on the previous drawing and the blue property. The green lines are showing that property line going away. So that little piece at the very bottom of the property is going to be added to the whole. And then um, the front property, the area shown in red, is going to be carved off. Um, and that will contain <clears throat> the one house at um, 101 Pelham Road. And then the other property, including that back area, is going to contain the other house at 103 Pelham Road. 
And um, the people here have already gone to the Zoning Board of Appeals and they've received a variance and they need a variance for this property because it's got a lot of anomalies. It's got, uh, it's not a very wide property, so it's really hard to do anything here. But um, there are a number of setback issues that are, are problematic. And um, in addition to that, it's, it's unusual to, to have two houses on one property. So they want to move them apart. Um, they don't really have enough frontage to have a flag lot. Um, they have 76 feet, uh, roughly 76 feet of frontage altogether. I think this is in the RN zoning district, so they would normally be required to have 120 square feet of frontage. They would have been required to have a 120 foot building circle in the middle of this property, but they obviously can't do that because this is too thin. Um, and there are setback issues. So they received a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals to accomplish what is shown on this plan. And so the next step for them is to actually take the step of dividing the property into two properties. And you can see that one property is going to have about 16 feet of frontage, which is enough to allow cars to travel back and forth. The other property will have about 60.7 feet of frontage. Um, and the back, the both properties will have the ability to travel over this driveway, just as they've always done in the past. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. And you may have some questions. And you did receive a copy of the variance text in your in your packets. So so we don't, you know, it's already been decided that this configuration is allowable or you know approved it by variance. That's and correct. So all you want us to do is to agree that this does not require a subdivision plan. That is correct. And then authorize the um, chair, uh, Mr. Marshall, to sign the plan on behalf of the planning board. Okay. All right. So board members, any questions? Any objection to me assigning this and agreeing that it's that this does not require subdivision approval. Uh, your silence and is deafening. So uh, I'm going to take that as a consensus, Chris, that we are OK with this. And you will tell me when I can come sign it. Thank you. And thanks okay. to Pam for providing the good information. She asked some good questions and we had a meeting with the building commissioner. So we were all clear on what was going on here. I think this is the first variance I've ever seen issued by the ZBA. Yeah. They don't issue very many. Seriously. Um, it's really unusual for them to issue a variance. Yeah, well, it's a change to the bylaw uh, that that you don't want to have everybody saying they can do it, right? So it's got to be really odd and special, and 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 hardship is the is the is the controlling uh, requirement here, is it? Hardship and shape of the lot. Hmm. Okay, but we're good. I mean, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. You're great, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see, that was item eight on our agenda. The time now is 9.43. Uh, Pam mm -hmm. and Chris, any uh, upcoming ZBA? Nothing new to report. All no, right. no, not tonight. How about SPP, SPR, and SUB applications? Yes, I think I've told you about these before, but we do have 463 West Street coming back to you because we didn't get an appropriate number of um, Planning board members to vote on the special permit for 463 West Street to extinguish um, previous special permits. So we have to bring that back to you. And then we have another special permit at um, 51 Spalding mm -hmm. Street, which is already a two family house. And one of the units has some um, lodgers and <clears throat> they need to clarify their parking issues and also um, clarify the fact that they have lodgers in this two-family house. So Nate is most conversant about this project. If you have questions about that, you could ask him 
Um, otherwise, you'll be seeing this, I think, on the 7th of September. I don't recall 463 West Street. Did I miss that hearing? That, that's the one that was already approved. It was Ron Verdier, the retaining wall in back of the building. Oh, OK. But um, there was a special permit to extinguish the uh, two ZBA permits from the 80s. And the hearing was continued. And when it was continued, there's only four voting members. And there needs to be five for a special permit. So okay, it has to come back. I think, OK, I must have missed that. OK. Yeah. OK. All right, so I guess moving on, uh, committee and liaison reports. Um, PVPC, we don't have anyone to represent that. Uh, mm -hmm. CPAC, Andrew is absent. Design Review Board, Tom is absent. Janet, how about the Solar Bylaw Working Group? We had another productive meeting. Um, Chris Brestrup gave an excellent overview of land use and um, mapping in Amherst, which you can't get enough of because you always look at it and try to learn new stuff. So she's kind of giving the board the literal lay of the land in Amherst. And then um, we had a long presentation by another member about the uh, mass decarbonization roadmap. And then the very, very recent plan for how, um, how to get there. And so it takes recommendations, the roadmap, and it puts together um, a plan um of like you know what sources of energy of renewable energy that the state will be looking at um and then also kind of a um martha Han hanner pointed out there's a new emphasis on um re you know natural lands as carbon sinks because even if we went to net zero today we're still in trouble and so we need to increase our capacity of the natural like farmland, forest lands and wetlands to absorb carbon dioxide. And so um, there's a new emphasis on that in the, in the plan. But it was just, it was really thorough and it's actually a really excellent plan. The problem with all these documents, they're like 150 pages and, you know, but they, they really go deep and they're interesting. And so that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, Nate. Yeah, I just want to say that um, the CPA, you know, in, in um, Andrew's absence, the CPA committee has um, put its schedule on their web page. And so proposals open September 1st and they're due by the end of September. So, you know, the next round of CPA proposals is, you know, starting soon and the committee will meet in November to start reviewing those. So, you know, just for everyone watching or who will watch that, it you know, the process is starting a little earlier, earlier this year and the, you know, the window to submit is the month of September. Okay, great. And Chris, anything you want to say about CRC? Um, the next CRC meeting, am I muted or not? No. No, you're good. Um, the next CRC meeting is on the 25th of August and they're going to be discussing rental registration. And then the CRC meeting after that, and this is some good news. I should have told you this under new business. We finally received our letter of final determination from FEMA with regard to our flood maps. So um, CRC is holding a continued public hearing on the flood maps on September 8th, and the planning board will hold its continued public hearing on the flood maps on September 7th. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to wrap it all up on September 7th, but at least it'll be coming back to you in a real form that we can act on if we choose to. All right. So. And Nate, is your hand up again? No. Okay. Um, okay. Then we're on to the report of the chair, and I have no report. Uh, other than to say this may be my my last meeting as chair because I think we do elections mm. next time, right, Chris? Elections next time. That's right. That's yep. right. So all, of, you know, um, I guess, uh, do we want to just have people show up at the meeting and with some, you know, if you're interested in a position or or representing the the board on a committee, uh, show up and you know be ready to say you're interested and would like to be appointed or, or elected to that position. I think that's a good idea. And also if you have ideas about who you want to um, nominate for different positions. So obviously Doug Marshall is our chair and I 
strongly support Doug Marshall as chair, but that is not up to me because I don't get to vote. Um, Tom Long is our vice chair. And I'm trying to think who is the clerk. Maria was the clerk. Maria was the clerk. And I don't think we have a clerk now. Right. So we so, need a, and, and for you new members, the clerk really doesn't take minutes or do clerk normal clerk things uh, because we have the expertise of Chris and Pam. And so the clerk is really, is the clerk third in line if the chair and the vice chair are both absent from a meeting? That's right, yes. And the clerk could chair a meeting. Okay, that, so that's the that predominant meeting. role of the clerk yep. at this point. So I wanted to make mention of the fact that um, Jack Jemsick is the alternate um, PVPC representative, and he is going to continue as the executive committee um, representative for the PVPC. But that leaves open the principal role of commissioner with PVPC. So people should be thinking about um, volunteering for that if that is of interest to them. And you had sent us an email that had some information about how often they meet and, yes. and uh, you know, kind of what level of commitment that is. Mm -hmm. So if you want me to send that again, do I think that would be great if you would. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe 10 days before our next meeting or, you know, I'm, I guess our next meetings, it feels like our next meeting is not just in 14 days. It's maybe three weeks from now. So, three weeks, yeah. So maybe send it a week before the next meeting. Okay. And, and my vague recollection from our last meeting was that you had talked about PVPC with Bruce and he was open to doing that. Bruce is open to doing it. Yep. And, and I see he confirmed with his thumb. Okay. All right. So I had no report. Uh, Chris? I have no report other than to say that we are not going to have a meeting on August 31st. Okay. We don't have any business to conduct. So, so that everybody night. have a good Labor Day. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And the time Pam. is 9.51, and I think we can adjourn. Thank you all Thank you. for your time and your service to the town. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.